must have a, a just system. You know, the self-help system that we've had where people just come and take what they want is not what the, the president of this country wants. It's not what any of us want. We just want to make sure that if there's no agreement on compensation, then the courts should be uh, asked to give a court order to say, yes, you can take the property and the compensation will be one rand or the compensation will be 100,000 rand, whatever. So yes, you can expropriate, you can issue a notice of expropriation, but if there's no agreement in relation to, to, to compensation, then the courts should be approached and they should establish what that compensation is, whether it's one rand, zero rand, or 100,000 rand doesn't matter. Those are all examples of what the court could decide. Otherwise, you get venal officials who do exactly what they did in the uh, in, in Ragasi case and the Kluti case. They, they decide they're going to give this property to an MK veteran or some pal of theirs, and they do it. And then the minister only finds out later. I mean, the minister, uh, Toko Dudiza, only found out later that Mr. Kluti's land was being taken away from him and given to and, and about to be given to somebody who was a friend of the of the official so with with the uh, we know with with the zondo commission and with the problems we have in this country with 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 honesty many officials are just able to be bribed and property is a big is a big draw card i mean if if you give if you give a friend a nice big property and you say well hang on i've wangled it so that you can get this and you could just do it without a court being involved well fantastic so all you're doing is opening the doors to those officials that happen to be bribable or dishonest to, to, to punish the citizens of this country. And that applies to black and white. It doesn't apply only to some people, it applies to everybody. So that's why I'm saying the rule of law must prevail. The courts must be involved if there's no agreement relating to compensation. That's what we're saying about sections eight and nine. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson, Madam Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Master, uh, for your presentation. Your presentation, we will uh, integrate with other presentations that we have received. If we found out that there's something that relates to a certain department, we will forward it to that department. And then we will discuss later on when we deal with all the written submissions, oral presentations, and the information that we'll get from public hearings. Thank you again. Uh, we will now invite our second uh, presenter, Ms. Priti Oliphant. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. Morning, morning, Ms. Priti. Over um, to you, Madam. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Priti Olifant. I'm from M. Kungonjobu in the KwaZulu Natal. Um, I'm a business owner, I'm a social entrepreneur, and I'm also highly involved in the arts as a performing artist um, as well. I'm actually so happy that we've reached this um, stage of um, talks regarding land and the expropriation bill. And my presentation today is just to highlight why I actually support this bill. My grandmother's family had acres of land and cattle in Makabele and in Guazulu Natal. Her father relocated to Peter Maritzburg, which is a city for work. Today, the land is no more. As we try to piece back the puzzle and retrace our steps, it's a mission close to my beloved 84 year old grandmother's heart and mine too. Over the weekend, I also found out that there's also one other family, a grandmother that I also came across, who also has the same issue. She had land in Bishopstow, but now she doesn't have the paperwork for the land and she would like to get her land back. It's just, it, it's just one of those very, very um, personal issues when we look back to our beloved um, elderly. As black people, land is the essence of our culture and heritage. For big festivals, we slaughter cows. For communication with our ancestors, we slaughter goats and sheep. When a young lady becomes of age during a Nisizulu ceremony called Umemulo, she wakes up in the wee hours of the morning, washes, eats, congregates with her peers at the river. We use moving waters and streams to cleanse. For fasting, ukupasa, meditation, we visit and we climb mountains. 
It's been over 20 years of democracy and this bill is centered in our constitution. I also believe that land is our inheritance as people of the soil, as people of the land with misappropriated land distribution. It is a deep injustice and it's deeply rooted within our society. It is a historical fact that black people were disenfranchised in this country and a redress is urgently needed. Our constitution clearly states that the land belongs to all those who live in it. However, the reality paints a painstakingly opposite, uh, opposing picture. Land for farming and cultivating to form a more sustainable society as our ancestors and those before them did. We want to work the land, we want to plow the land. Um, we anxiously waiting the cannabis uh, bill so that we're able to use hemp to plant hemp that is able to uh, produce blocks, textile, biodiesel, and so forth. Um, and then traditional medicine strives on access and ownership of land and natural resources. And we saw during COVID that we do need to actually look and focus on alternative medicine. Tourism, arts, culture, business would greatly benefit from the bill as artists, activists, entrepreneurs, companies and organizations alike would take full advantage of the expropriation bill. As it is, we already have cultural villages. We already have artists who form artistic villages. Um, over the weekend, we were honoring our legends in Guazulu Natal, our musical legends, and we were on a property that was owned, that is a golf estate, has tennis courts, has um, halls where you're able to host events and so forth. And we'd like to have more access to events and, and, and venues like that, or be able to grow such so that we're able to build our communities once more. And as we know, art is healing. So that will definitely be at the center of our healing. Land ownership is a dignity issue. It tackles hopelessness, fertil um, sorry, facilities, um, sorry, facilitate strong family structures, which we desperately need as a nation, um, and pride and allegiance in one's country. I'd mentioned prior, but COVID-19 showed us that there is a dangerous imbalance in this country. A majority of our people live packed up in shacks and townships with minimum, if any, rec recreational or sporting facilities. So social distancing, self-isolation, and self-quarantining become a far-fetched myth. We know that any virus or bacteria that affects one system needs to be met with a strong immune system. One of the best ways to boost one's, uh, one's immune system is through the food we eat, making food our medicine. We need land to grow our herbs, fruits, and, and veggies. Um, we witness ginger prices skyrocketing, skyrocketing and becoming unaffordable to the masses. We need the land and campaigns that get us back to self-sustainability. Let it be a lifestyle to us. And just in closing as well, you know, we know that we've had the tribal authorities assisting with accessibility to land, but also just to look at um, ownership when it comes to women, because there's still an imbalance when it comes to that. If you're not married, if you're young and you're a woman, you still don't have authority um, or access to the tribal land. So this uh, appropriation bill will also help in terms of um, gender equality. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Pretty Oliphant, uh, for your presentation. I'm now inviting members to ask clarity seeking questions. Honorable members. Honorable members. Uh, in, in the absence of any hand, uh, Ms. Uh, Pretty Oliphant, we, we really appreciate uh, that a young woman is coming to present uh, to us. We will take your presentation just like others, consolidate it and discuss it later on when we are discussing as a committee. Thank you for coming to us. Thank you, thank you. We, we, we now invite um, the Transvaal Lenbo Uni, which will be represented by Mr. Van Zeyl. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair and other members of the Portfolio Committee and other people listening to us today. My pledge today is focusing on the economic growth, and that is for us the important thing, but I want to collaborate on that and put some other issues on the table as well. 
any institution or individual who has a little pride and integrity will be concerned about the legacy that will be left behind. It strikes one as dumb to experience how the NC persistently clings to an obsolete ide ideology that has proven worldwide that it has only caused poverty. We need growth and that is so important. That's the only way we can actually give opportunities to people. The economic rules of the game are very simple and even children understand the concept of having to work to be able to have. And also that prosperity is not something that is there, but that it must be created by managing the factors of production towards profitability. Those factors of production, namely the entrepreneur, capital, raw materials and labor are managed by the entrepreneurs. They are the people who take the risk to do business. If successful, they are the, 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 there will be profits and from the state um, and that the state earns tax money and in that regard. If any entrepreneur does not do it right, their temp will fail and he will experience bankruptcies. Entrepreneurs consider doing business if there is confidence in the circumstances in which businesses will be conducted. This is where you came in as a government. Modern farming is nothing but a business. Um, furthermore, um, Farming is not an occupation. Farming is a way of life. Soldiering, or soldiers for that case, is not going to war. That is not where they focus on. It is to keep in the peace. Farming is for most modern farmers, is to protect the free market economy because that's the only mechanism that can create wealth. The government has two major responsibilities in a democracy, namely that the safety of all residents must be taken care of. And secondly, a climate must be created with a policy environment in which investors will want to invest their money in confidence. If there are not enough investments, there will, not, there will be no economic growth and the necessary resources will not be created to be able to pay sufficient taxes. The state's ability to establish their responsibility for health, security service, infrastructure creation, and very important good education and training will simply be too limited and the state will not in that case, be able to actually address that issues and they will let the people of the country down. In addition to the above reality, the NC government has over time had a policy of greater deployment, where expertise in positions was not the criteria, but rather appointments on racial grounds, with the result that many once thriving institutions are managed into the ground. Add to that the corruption that has become almost a norm at all levels and the table has been set for one of the greatest failures of state yet seen. And no one of us want that. We want a successful country that is thriving and there will be a success in the view of everyone and for every citizen in this country. South Africa's constitution stipulates that everyone must be treated as equal citizens. The ANC violates the constitution in its entirety with favor not only on racial grounds, but based on only certain elements of a certain race. The question that government must honestly answer today is whether they think that economic growth can be achieved in any other way than according to the economic rules of the game. And the other thing, does the government think that any right thinking investor in a country will invest its assets if the government makes legislation and even wants to enshrine it in the constitution that assets may be taken from investors without paying for it? I stated to the government today that you are stealing the future of South Africa's people. You are stealing the future of all our children and grandchildren. Your efforts strive to establish poverty for all the country by destroying every opportunity to take our country forward successfully. South Africa urgently, urgently needs investors and entrepreneurs. Your policy of transformation, BEE and expropriation with your compensation is probably the best deterrent that you can put in place to drive these people far away from South Africa. If you are honest, you will make it clear to your followers that you have made a policy choice of poverty for all, except your kindness, for, but that is near the fire and it will soon dry up for them as well. A responsible government that truly really puts the interests of the people first will realize that every possible thing must be done to grow the economy. What is successful, you must fully support. You must make South Africa the most favorable and safest country for investors, folk, folk skills. Say thank you to the
the people who create wealth and stimulate those who create more and more jobs by giving them rather incentives. But you choose to make the labor, giving our econo economic re reality unaffordable and thus increase unemployment even further. Your choice from which the social allowance is paid will dry up somewhere. And then you will certainly not be able to handle the time bomb that you are building if anarchy the ongoing goal must be economic growth. None of us can change the rules and pretend that it's needed to create growth. The market forces continue to operate, and if the requirements are not met, the market will throw off those businesses' bankruptcy and the country jump status for that matter. The following chart, and I send it through to you, I hope that everyone do have it in the Actually, if it's possible, I can share it um, to show you this growth because this is a growth chart. And if you do not apply to this, um, okay, I see I cannot. I think, I think we're losing you. Sorry, do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you Hello, clearly. do you hear me now? We can hear you clearly Jade, now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, these requirements are, they should be profits in businesses so that they can be paid, like they can pay taxes. They should be trust for people to invest their money. We need skilled workers, so the training and education is so important. Technology, technology should be used as good as possible. Private ownership is the baseline for people to want to invest money. Low tax rate, low inflation rate, there should be competition. A transparent fiscal and monetary policy, a spirit of saving, motivated workers, investment, international credit worthiness, infrastructure should be good low rents and the free market principle driven economy. Those are the requirements to bring you to the conditions. And that is, you have to increase the productivity in your country and the net application and improvement of production factors, such as labor capital, entrepreneur and land, the, the raw, the raw um, resources of your country. Those are the things that's needed to get to a higher growth in the economy. You cannot change that around and we should apply every legislation and every announcement we have to go and check it out against these principles and see, do we apply or not? The important question today is not if we as TLU or Kusatu or even the parliament are going to accept this act as proposed, but the question should rather be, will the markets accept it? That is for us very important. The markets should accept it because that is the thing that create um, the opportunity for people to um, have come in the system, and that is what inhabitants, the following proposal for an expropriation act are presented. Abandon your concept of expropriation without compensation in totally. Abandon the expropriation of any asset for public interest. Adjust the previous act to streamline it so that for the public purpose, with fair compensation that is market related, land can be expropriated for the creation of infrastructure that must be established in the interest of South Africa and its, all its inhabitants. And then state-owned land, and that's not part of the act, but I think we have to put it down here, um, must be given to emerging farmers who want to farm, and the title deed must also be issued for them. And suggestions and proposals on how this should be done have been submitted through a lot of organizations, as such as ourselves since 2005, and how they can actually be implemented to give people a opportunity to make success out of agriculture because we talk on behalf of agriculture. It is experienced that US government are much more obsessed with trying to save the ANC instead of making the country prosperous. Our request is that US government should put the people of South Africa first and do the one thing that is needed to create opportunities for everyone and that is to grow the economy. You will be surprised how many institutions and role players will help you to do that if you establish a safe and sound policy environment. I thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Fanzil. Uh, I now invite honorable members for clarity seeking questions.
Honorable Marcelle, uh, followed by Honorable Franz Garvey. Honorable Marcelle, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, greetings to yourself, uh, members, and uh, all the participants. <coughs> Chair, quickly, uh, to the presenter, maybe what is his understanding of uh, land disposition in, in South Africa? The second question would be, also, what is his understanding of uh, sustainable development? If he can respond to that, probably one will be at peace with uh, his presentation. Honorable Franz Carvey, over to you. Thank you, Chairperson, and good morning to Chairperson, the members, the uh, support staff as well as our invited guests. Chairperson, I would uh, just like, I'm, I'm clear on what has been presented by Mr. Fansel, but he mentioned we as an e e ad abbreviation. Can we get an indication of which uh, organization is, is representing? Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Fanzel. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, um, let's start from the beginning. Um, yeah, South Africa do have a history of land dispossession, but all the nations that actually at this stage stay in South Africa are part of that. Um, there's a lot of an announcements and accusations against the, the white people that they came in the country and stole the land. But my question today is, when the black people came from the north and um, down to South Africa, from whom did they buy the land? They also take the land. So I don't think that we should actually address the history. We will, should build a history. We can accuse each one all the time with different approaches. We have a written up history and there's something wrong with all the nations. No one is clear in everything we talk about. We talk about um, we talk about a lot of things. If we want to focus on that, there's no opportunity for us to take hands and build the future. And I think that's the reason why we say, let's make 2022 a better year and try to see what can we do to give opportunities for a lot of people that is very, very um, positive for all the role players. Our concern is that at this stage, our economy do not grow. And my focus today is on the economy. We cannot create opportunities for people if the economy is not growing. And that is sustainable development. And that means that businesses and, indiv and individuals that is in business should make a profit. That's the only way you will be there next year to have another opportunity. So sustainability means that we have to develop the economy so that people have jobs and not a rising unemployment rate that we experienced the last few years. So we have to grow the economy. We can tell each one eat anything we want. We can play politics. We can play play racial issues, that will not uh, uh, address this issue of um, opportunities for people. So we need, for sure at this stage, a growing economy. And that is, gives the opportunity for people to actually get sustainable development so that you have tax money paid, so that the government is in a position that they can develop infrastructure, give better training to people. There's a lot of things that have to be addressed. And for us, that is very important. Um, for Mrs. Van Skalkweg, thank you for your question. TLU South Africa is an organized agricultural union. We used to be way back since 1897 when we were established. We used to be the Transvaal Agricultural Union. At this stage, we are only now in our constitution as stipulated TLU South Africa, and we represent commercial farmers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairperson, you're not audible.
Um, Honourable Members, I think the Chairperson is having um, connectivity issues. Honourable Mchowo, can you please go um, take the meeting over until the Chairperson is sorted? Yes, Nola. Nola? Yes, Honourable Mchowo, I was requesting that you um, take the meeting through um, until we get the Chairperson back online. I think she's having connectivity she's issues. Back. Oh, is she back now? Yes. Ah, the issue of network. Uh, uh, apologies to our honorable members, our guests, and our team. Thank you. Uh, is the Mr. Cameron Dugmore who will be speaking on behalf of the official opposition in the Western Cape Legislature in? Is yes, he in? I'm, I'm present, chairperson. I'm present. You are ready, yes? Yes. Okay. You are welcome in our committee. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chairpers, Honourable Chair and Members. Chair, I would um, like to start with uh, an, an apology um, for submitting the, the oral presentation late. And I know it is tough on members to get through all the presentations, so please accept my humble apology in that regard. I do have a presentation which I would like to share on the screen. I'm not sure whether the committee coordinator um, has enabled me to do that because then if there's screen sharing, I'd like to put up the presentation chair. Ms. Martinez, may you allow him to? Okay, you have been given rights to share. Okay, thank you. Let me try this out. Um, wait, no, sorry, that's... Um, I'm just trying to find this. Um, can members uh, see that? Not can yet. Members, can you see that? Not yet. Can you please try again? Okay. Um, let me just try again. Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to waste the committee's time. Um, Okay, let me just try and get back into screen sharing. Okay, share screen. Okay, I must first push that right. Okay. Um, can uh, members see that now? Not yet, okay. not yet. You can see that? Not on my side. Uh, so, and now, Chairperson? Okay. Okay, let me try to share it from my side, Mr. Dagmo. Let's, let's uh, see if it works. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Sorry about that. There we go. You've got it on the screen now, Mr. Dagmo. You can carry I've on. I've got it. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Oi. Okay. Um. Okay. Just go to the bottom, to the, to the lower, um, to the lower row. Just yeah. Below the presentation. Okay. I'm just, I'm powerful. just trying to get rid of this here. Uh, okay, first click enable editing. Okay, there we top. are. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see the presentation. It's just that it's not beamed up full screen. So I'm, okay. I'm suggesting that you click enable editing and then you go beam it at the bottom. <clears throat> just one second. I...
Do you see the yellow line on top yes. of the screen? Please yes. click there. There's a, the, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a button, enable editing. Click on that one. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just, um, Ms. Martinisa, would you mind just trying to share yours uh, just to avoid, I'm just battling with this now. Would, would, you, the, would you try and share yours? Let me do it from my side. That should be fine. Wait. Okay. Is that visible, honorable members? Yes, it is. Okay, okay thank you very much. Um, just to proceed, um, as indicated um, by the chair, um, my name is Cameron Dugmore. I'm an ANC MPL in the Western Cape and the um, leader of the official opposition. Um, just to say that from our point of view as the ANC caucus and the official opposition in the Western Cape, we welcome this bill. We believe that the bill is long overdue and is much needed. And we want to emphasize this as one of the tools uh, to help with the comprehensive land redistribution for agriculture, for human settlements, industrial development, not only in our province, but in our country. We believe that the bill has been carefully crafted in line with our constitution of the Republic and the rule of law, and that will, it will clearly assist with redress measures to ensure, as our constitution um, requires of us, that the injustices of the past are addressed in a sustainable manner. Um, we want to emphasize, obviously, this legislation is tagged as Section 76. So for us in the province, it is absolutely critical that our people have an opportunity to input directly. And it's important that the voice of the landless and obviously all sectors are heard um, on this particular matter. We think that's going to be critical in terms of ensuring successful implementation. If you can move on to the next slide. Um, there was a discussion briefly um, on the previous presentation um, around the issue of dispossession. And the point that we want to make here is that in our province in particular, that the colonial dispossession and the legacy of apartheid spatial planning is very much alive in our province. And one of the things that we would like to ask the committee, I think we're aware that various land audits have been done by land affairs, and there was also one by public works. Um, but clearly, we need to approach our ministers, responsible ministers, to update these audits, um, which have been completed, um, so that in particular, we can get a very accurate picture of the ownership of private land in our province, and that that needs to be compiled in regard to race, gender, and nationality. Because in the audit report that um, I've looked at, um, there isn't that level of detail. And what we why we also believe that's important, it's in regard to agricultural land in particular in our province. Um, there's no definite um, answer on this, but the estimates um, in terms of the minimal ownership of, of black South Africans, and by that I mean African colored and Indian farmers, is literally less than 2%. Um, but we, we then as the opposition, honorable chair and members, we try to request this information from our own MEC for agriculture in the province, Dr. Ivan Mayer, to say, let's look at private ownership of agricultural land. And he indicated that his department surprisingly does not keep such records. And he said, we must go to the deeds office. Now, we, we believe that it's not helpful when a province in effect turns a blind eye to racially skewed ownership patterns. And that's why we're requesting members to get, we need updated land audits linked to um, information manage, uh, information management systems so we can get a clear sense of the situation we're dealing with. Next slide, thank you. Um, right, now I talked a little bit about agricultural land and the fact that we need updated information, but when we look at the patterns of urban land ownership in our province, we have a situation where White South Africans own 70.7% of urban land in our province, while colored South Africans own 10.7%, Indians 8%, and Africans 35 And this is in stark contrast to the demographics of our province, as per the census 2011, which are um, colored population 48.8, black African 32.8, Indian 1%, and the white community 57 
And what's interesting is that it is only in the Western Cape and the Northern Cape where in regard to urban land ownership, that the historically white population own the majority of urban land. In all other provinces, the majority of urban land is owned by the black majority as defined African, colored and Indian. So we're raising these figures to point out the reality of the situation in the Western Cape and how unsustainable it, in fact it is. And we're not doing this to fuel racial polarization. We support non-racialism and we believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, as per the Freedom Charter. But unless we look at the reality of this, we're going to miss the, the absolute importance of moving on the um, land redistribution um, that has been um, held back in our country. Next point, next slide. So on, on the bill, um, we think it's, it's, um, it's, it's very clear that the, the definition section, which provide both for the purpose being the public purpose and public interest is, is absolutely critical. Um, and, it, and the fact that it also applies, and I'm sure that's going to be linked to the section 25 um, process, that they, for those instances where expropriation with no compensation may be appropriate in the public interest. And I think it's particularly important and we support the definition that has been provided in pu for public interest, which is that the nation's commitment to land reform and to reforms to bring about equitable access to all of our South Africa's natural resources in order to redress the results of past racial discriminatory laws. That comes from our constitution doesn't come from somewhere else, it comes from our, our constitution. So this bill, in fact, is more than just a tool to be used for a so-called public purpose, which is the more narrow definition, any purpose connected with the administration of the provision of any law by an organ of state. So the public interest then gives it a broader um, purpose, which assists us as one of the tools we can use in regard to the land distribution necessity. Next slide. So that's, I'm just um, emphasizing that point. So it's the bill's purpose is not simply to assist with what can be referred to as traditional expropriation. In other words, the building of roads and infrastructure, but it is indeed a transformatory bill, which will assist our government at all spheres to drive the socioeconomic transformation our province and country needs. It thus gives clarity to some of the redress provisions in our constitution, in particular 25.2a, and sections 25.5, 25.6, 25.7, and 25.8. But it's important also to emphasize that the bill also asserts the right to administrative action that is lawful and the right to have disputes resolved in a fair public hearing both before a court or another independent and impartial tribunal. Because often there's a narrative created here that um, what is intended is a so-called land grab um, and a chaotic situation. We um, appreciate the, the focus of this, of both being transformatory, but also being consistent with the, the provisions um, of our constitution in regard to, to um, lawful administrative action. Next uh, slide. And then um, one of the issues that is a concern that we have is that um, various organs of state at provincial or local sphere, as per the definition in section 239 of the constitution may be reluctant to play their role as expropriating authorities. We do take some comfort from clause 3.2, which states that if an organ of state other than an expropriating authority satisfies the minister that, that it requires a particular property for a public purpose, then the minister must expropriate that property on behalf of that organ of state upon its written request and obviously subject to an accordance with the provisions of the act. Now, our reading of, of this by way of example is if, for instance, a municipality in our province or any other province refuses to initiate the expropriation of land for agriculture on request from emerging farmers, then another organ of state, for instance, the, the Department of Agriculture, can approach the minister and seek to satisfy him or her that it requires the property in the public interest. So we need to ensure that municipalities cannot frustrate the objectives of the bill. And that is why that particular provision um, of clause 3.2 is important, which allows an organ of state that isn't an expropriating authority to make the argument for expropriation. Next slide. And then just on section eight, the notice of expropriation requires that the expropriating authority must cause a notice to be served. Um, and also on the known holders of unregistered rights, um, whose rights in that property are to be expropriated. Now. 
We all know that there's a massive community interest regarding issues of land restitution reform and security of tenure. So in that context, it's critical that serious consideration be given to the manner in which the broader community is informed of the intended purpose. Because obviously in the correspondence that's directed, it's directed to the landowner or the municipality. But we think that possibly in the regulations, we must give attention so that the community where an expropriation is, is going to happen also is aware that it's going to happen. This is the purpose so that there's transparency in the process and that these don't become rumors in, in corridors. It actually is in the public domain and that will assist in ensuring the sustainability of this um, bill. Next slide, please, um, Ms. Martinise. Um, so I've dealt with, um, yeah, and then the second last slide um, just talks to the need for a clear implementation plan. Um, um, obviously, once the bill has been um, adopted and assented to by the president, because I think all of us as, as members um, would agree, and uh, definitely from the legislature side as well, we often face the challenge of implementation of legislation in regard to the human resources that is required, the budget, and also the broader education of the community. And um, <clears throat> when we don't have clear implementation plans, the, the, and this is a massive undertaking, this is a transformatory massive project that's going to advance the issue of land redistribution. So we need to make sure that we have a plan that is backed up and our appeal to members of this committee is to insist that this department provides a detailed implementation plan um, with budgets to ensure that the people of our province and the country benefit from this legislation. I want to point out for the example that we had in the Western Cape where the former Tafelberg School in Seapoint, which currently stands empty, domestic workers and general workers had identified this for social housing. And despite the fact that the province went ahead and sold the property to private interest. Although this, the decision was overturned by the High Court, the province refuses to make the site available. So it is in instances like this to give hope to, to our people that this bill, once law, should be able to assist those, like in this case, the domestic workers of Seapoint in the public interest. I think we're we going to the last slide now. Um, the conclusion. In conclusion, honorable chair and members, we'd like to thank the committee and the department for all the work done um, on this bill. We know it's been a long time coming, but we want to emphasize that in your hands is a bill that actually provides hope to those who have been dispossessed of land and property by past discriminatory laws. And we believe also it should be seen by those who have benefited from past injustices as an opportunity to actually assist in providing equitable access to land and property in line with the constitution and the rule of law. So we appeal to all parties and stakeholders to see this bill as part of the package of measures to undo what our president has referred to as the original sin of land dispossession. And where possible, we also think um, that local and district social compacts should be looked at at a local and district level so that where possible municipalities get stakeholders together. We say this is the land that we have. We agree on reform, redistribution and security of tenure where workers um, battle um, uh, from evictions from certain farms. So let's, let's also continue those efforts. But we do know that this bill, once law, will ensure that where it's needed, it will be used to ensure that just and equitable land redistribution finally happens in our province and our country. Um, thank you very much, Chairperson and members. Uh, thank you, Honorable Dagumo, for your presentation. Um, I'm now inviting Honorable members um, for clarity seeking questions. Honorable Graham Murray. Uh, uh, excuse me, just a little bit. It's going to be Honorable Graham Murray, followed by Honorable Shabalala. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Dagmore, um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was certainly considered. Um, I just have one question. With respect to um, the section where you highlighted the fact that where um, an expropriating authority refuses to expropriate, um, it can be referred then to a potentially higher authority. 
My concern there, and, and this is the first time it's been raised, so um, it's not something that I think I've given much consideration to. My question then to you is, is that not a usurpment of um, the separation of powers or potentially the an interference in the spheres of government? Will that not then go against the cooperative governance that the constitution demands, where um, one level of government or one sphere of government then has the authority to override an existing sphere of government? And in the example that you cited, where the province has decided to sell a piece of property to a private investor, um, and then um, the minister comes in um, at a national level and says, well, you know, you can't do that, we're going to expropriate it. So um, you've actually, for me, raised another flaw in the bill that interferes directly in cooperative governance um, that is constitutionally enshrined. So I'd like to know whether or not you agree with that, with that interpretation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Graham Murray. Honorable Shabalala. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, oh, oh. Mine will be. Uh, mine will be around, uh, uh, and uh, I wish to appreciate the the presentation that has been done by uh, Mr. Dagmore. Uh, safe to say that I appreciate also the indication and the emphasis on the constitutionalism of our democracy, where it, for me, it, clear, it cleared the issue of land grabbing um, uh, on, re, on, on, on the, on the program that will be run by the, the department uh, staff. But at the same time, it, um, it gives emphasis on the legal uh, records and legal uh, avenues. So it doesn't take away, it balances between the, the emphasis on the rights, constitutional rights, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, 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 the bill. Thank you. Thank you, um, Honorable Shabalala. Any other hand? Um, over to you, Honorable Dagmo, to respond to the questions raised. Um, yes, um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to um, the members um, who've raised a question and comment. Just in response to Honorable um, Graham, um, my sense is that, um, you know, we are in a situation here where compared to the um, previous law on expropriation, we have a bill, and that's what that I was also trying to get across in, our, in, in my presentation, um, which is transformatory in the sense that it is not confined to historical narrow interpretations of expropriation for a road. It actually is a tool also to effect broader distribution. And there are different laws in this country, and I'm sure the committee has um, looked at that, which um, gives certain powers of expropriation to different authorities. My understanding of the point that I was making is that there might well be um, national departments um, or other departments which, in terms of particular laws that we have at the moment, are not regarded as expropriating authorities. And I think there's a clear outline of the powers of the minister. My understanding is that if um, a municipality and municipalities are in fact expropriating authorities, as I would understand from the legislation. So if you had a municipality um, that for its own reasons, um, which possibly were against the, the redress um, injunction of the constitution decided um, not uh, to proceed, and but it is an expropriating authority, you might then have another national department who says, look, we really need, um, in terms of food security and food production, we need to establish um, a hydroponics plant on this piece of land. And then that department could then, and the procedure is very clear, even though that department would not be an expropriating authority, it could go to the national minister and make the case. And the national minister of public works being an expropriating authority could then do that. I think ultimately these issues are going, will probably be tested um, in the courts, but my own understanding is that provided that expropriation meets the definition of the public interest, um, that is um, what is in, intended here. 
um, that you would be able to, as a non-expropriating authority department, approach the national minister um, to expropriate um, at, at a local level. That is my um, understanding um, of this. Thank you, uh, Honorable Dagmo. Uh, again, let's appreciate um, your presentation, which is very clear with clear recommendations. We will also integrate it with other presentation and discuss as the committee. Uh, thank you for your time. We now invite uh, Honorable Faiz, who will be representing, uh, I want to just read it as it is, I want to, Honorable Faiz read it wrongly. Uh, Mr. Faiz, Honorable Faiz Jacobs, who will be speaking on behalf of Cape Flats communities. You are welcome, Honorable Faiz. Thank you, Chairperson, and uh, greetings to all the, uh, all the members. Um, I am very honored to be part of this panel. Um, it's indeed an honor and a challenge to address the expropriation, to address you on the expropriation bill and the proposed amendments to section 25 of the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. It's an honor because it begins to address the long-standing aspirations of our people and their dreams deferred finally coming into the realm of possibility. It's also a challenge because we must find collective and the political will to do right with our people, implement and redress the original sin. I think uh, my comrade Cameron alluded to it and also the president made mention to it. And I'm reminded by the preamble of our constitution and it states, and I quote, we the people of South Africa recognize the injustice of our past, honor those who have suffered for freedom in our land and respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, believe that South Africa belongs to all in love who live in it, united in our diversity. We therefore, through our pre freely elected representatives, adopt that constitution, this constitution, as the supreme law of the country. Let me go up and um, just go down, I don't have to read the whole. Um... Let me introduce myself. I'm Faiz Jacobs. I'm a grandson of my family, my mother's side that was uprooted from their home, their culture and heritage in Claremont. I'm also here for my grandfather, the late Buya Haji Ibrahim Jacobs who had the original deed of sale to start the farm. Its location is about in the high level road in Strand, whose claim remains unsettled. I'm also here to represent, to be a representative of our proud people that has trauma and deep scars and painful memories. I represent communities that make Cape Flats its home. Despite being destined to be drugged, drunk, and house niggers in inverted commas to white privilege, despite being treated like second-class Capetonians, kept in backyards and in shacks, with daily forced removals, daily evictions, and water drip systems that we have to experience. We are here, we want to be seen, we want to be listened to, we want an inclusive housing market, we want well-located land for affordable housing, and more importantly, we want an end to structural spatial inequality, especially here in the Cape Town. We want collective and political will to implement, despite the noise of those who seek the status quo. Please go up. My second point, addressing the national grievance of land and property dispossession. The expropriation bill is therefore a milestone in our democracy as it is in the public interest and geared towards transformation. Core to the liberation of African colored and in Indian people is the land question. True to these values, 
the expropriation, expropriation bill is a practical expression of the commitment that the African National Congress-led government has to the black majority who still suffers from the legacies of colonialism, apartheid, and also land deprivation. We still feel the effects of the draconian apartheid laws like the Group Areas Acts, and the slow pace of land reform has compounded the effects on the Black African, Black colored, and the Black Indian population. We were removed from our land and evicted from our houses. This act not only tore communities apart and families, but also removed our people's sense of belonging as their heritage and culture was also taken away. We know that some was already compensated under the democratic dispensation, but it's a drop in the ocean. Whilst the majority await such compensation, furthermore, the amounts that was compensated in the past viewed by many as an insult to one's integrity. This national grievance for land and property dispossession therefore needs to be urgently addressed by our government and the spirit and the letter of this bill give effect to this. What is the weakness of our current legislation and the powers of provinces, pro local and certain departments? Our previous attempts with ex expropriation in the democratic dispensation was centered around the notion of the willing buyer and willing seller. Please go down. This notion wrongly assumed the patience of the poor and the dispossessed will be matched by the generosity of the rich and the privileged. This notion failed because the majority of the owners were not prepared to sell at a reasonable, reasonable and fair price. The willing buyer, willing seller principle therefore delayed the restitution, delayed the redistribution and re reinforced the current spatial development that we are experiencing. These disputes over compensation restricted the key principles of, of redistribution. Um, this bill attempts to address that by introducing both the criteria where we will compensate and also the criteria where there will be no compensation. I believe this is a step in the right direction and it will fast track land restitution, redistribution and effect that transformation that we need. The process of the expropriating authority and owners or holders of unregistered rights in property to agree on compensation must be fair, must be transparent, but most importantly, it must be quick. How the, my fourth point, how the constitution supports the expropriation bill. I think my learned uh, comrade uh, Cameron spoke to this, so I'll skip this uh, section. We can go up. We can go up, you can just scroll up. Why are we making this uh, submission as the Cape Flats communities? I think uh, again, uh, leader of opposition Cameron um, alluded to the fact, but here in the Western Cape and the city of Cape Town, this government has been unable and also unwilling to make land available to the poor, to the working class communities for both human settlement and also our development. In the context of the Western Cape, a large part of the poor and the working class live as backyard dwellers with up to four generations of family in one stand due to the lack of provision in housing. Just go to any house in Heidefeld, you'll see up to 30 people staying in one house. This is compounded by the growth of informal settlement which spilled over into land evasion and racial conflict. Some of these land evasions are on rail servitudes, which are a danger to our lives and people, and also disrupt the function of the railway. On the other hand, the province is also characterized by much corruption with the housing waiting lists, which cause further suffering for the poor and the working class, whose only desire is a piece of land with a home they can call their own. Thus, the DA's political priorities here is not to rectify the injustices of the past, but to perpetuate them through continuous prioritization of land for commercial activities, building speculators for affluent at the expense of the working poor. 
The Western Cape is characterized by continuous and constant evictions. Even during the lockdown, when the national regulations was against evictions. Remember Pulalani Kolani? He was dragged naked from his Kailicha shack. This inhumane treatment and illegal occupation and evictions is still happening in all of our areas. Makasa, Itembi, Ocean View, Hanburg, to name but a few. At the center of our understanding of land question is the issue of land evasions. The dispossessed African can colored communities are forced to occupy empty spaces of land because we simply can't afford it. And through this, this is referred to as land grabs. It's also a in clear indication of the crisis of land dispossession and the legacy of apartheid and colonialism. This bill must provide sufficient protection for the holders of unregistered rights over property. The city of Cape Town continues to implement spatial, apartheid spatial planning geared towards disadvantaging our communities as said. Please proceed, go up. I think um, there were four properties uh, and uh, Honorable um, Cameron alluded to the fact land could have been used for social housing. Instead, it was used for commercial. Uh, Tafel, Tafelberg High School was mentioned. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is clear that the city is not prepared to use land by located land for social housing. The city is determined to sell off prime location for property speculation instead of helping affordable housing. What the city and the DA does in practice is to reduce communities to structures commonly known as tin cans or blockies door. We've seen that in Delft, where communities were forced to relocate in 2007. Also, another example is the Bromwell Street uh, community in Salt River. Uh, communities were dispossessed, so we have a high-rise Woodstock hub standing there, but we have local people can't afford any housing options in that, in that area. So clearly, in conclusion, and also recommendations, um, the expropriation bill seeks to address this seeks to distribute land. Um, and especially here in the Western Cape, uh, the DA government continues to try to perpetuate the apartheid spatial racial planning. But you know, our fights is not lost here in the DA, uh, against the DA. Even our courts, the recent court ruling in the Western Cape High Court on the 24th of August, granted temporarily interdict against the cities continuous evictions and demol demolitions of um, structures. This is a milestone and we thank the judiciary. We also want to acknowledge movements like Ndifunda Kukwazi, Ground Up and Reclaim the City in the Western Cape for their continued efforts to struggle against the Western Cape and city government on its, for its total onslaught against the poor and for re refusing to designate housing for the poor on state land. Some of the recommendations that I'm making, we therefore call for the support for the establishment of law of general applicable application so that we can restitute property and land to deal with the dispossess. We call for support for common framework in line with the constitution to guide this process um, uh, for the expropriating of property, including organs of the state we call and we support the call for expropriating authority to determine instance where compensation must be paid or not. We support the position that this is a function of the executive and not the courts. We support the position that the bill needs to have mechanisms that can hold municipalities, provinces responsible for both the redistribution uh, of property and will ensure assets in the hand of poor as a direct measure to deal with and address inequality. Given the traumatic and hard road that brought us at this point, this expropriation bill must and will address inequality and poverty. The history of the dispossess in the Cape runs deep and the scars of our communities bequeathed in its legacy of social dysfunctionality that we experience and contend today with. Whilst we are acutely aware of the tragedies of District 6, little has been done to the communities of Ndabini, uh, Simonstown, Cork Bay, Constantia, Cl 
Claremont District, District 1 in Greenpoint. Those communities also need healing. The Banking Association of South Africa, I listened to their presentation. They should be ashamed. They have historically failed to create progressive financial instruments to create land and property ownership for all. South Africa, even after the role banks played in the redlining our communities during apartheid. I'm not sure everybody knows what redlining is. You may ask, what is redlining? It is when banks deny mortgages to black people or make it prohibitively expensive for mostly people of color in urban areas, preventing them from buying homes in certain neighborhoods or getting loans to renovate houses. While this practice is now outlawed, it has been a practice during apart apartheid. I call on banks to play their part and help heal our country. To the agricultural organizations who have made submissions and recommendations here, I say plainly, stop being selfish. Stop only focusing on your own concerns. Why have you not helped the dispossessed communities where you farmed? Instead, farm evictions is on the rise. Why have you not helped government in the last 26 years with real and lasting solutions to create equitable redress? We've seen examples um, the last 12 years in the D with DA rule in the Western Cape has demonstrated that these agricultural formations seek to entrench status quo and consolidate the historical benefit. Many of you still benefit on long lease of farms, generous trade deals negotiated on, our, on behalf of our government, but still want to pay starvation slave wage. Show some goodwill. Let's hear and see, and more importantly, find each other. We as the ANC must admit that we have made mistakes. We must do better. We must now listen to our people. This bill seeks to make amends and give the majority of South Africans hope. This bill must restore dignity to the people of the Cape Flats and many communities like us. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Faiz Jacobs. I now uh, invite Honorable Members for clarity seeking questions. Uh, Honorable Kriam Mare. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Jacobs. I appreciate the input. Um, I just have one question for you. You have purported to represent the Cape Flats communities. I can't find any record of any organization that exists called Cape Flats Communities. So my question is, is that from where do you derive your mandate to speak on, on behalf of the Cape Flats Communities? And um, at what point, how many people do you represent that have given you that specific mandate? Um, because I'm concerned that you have come here to represent um, an organization, but in actual fact, the organization doesn't exist. And therefore your mandate is um, fallacious. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Faiz. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I said I'm a public representative. I proudly represent the organization called the African National Congress. The African National Congress has deployed me to Greater uh, Athlone. In Athlone, we have what we call a broad community of Cape Flats. It represents the majority of people, working class, mainly colored, mainly African communities. This presentation that I did, I didn't do it on my behalf only. I represent those communities, those dispossessed communities. I don't want to repeat what I've said, but if the honorable member listened, I am a product of that communities. I am a, a, um, a member, my, my family have been dispossessed. My grandfather has lost our land because of apartheid and because of the dispossession. So I have a right to speak here, I will, maintain that right, and I will continue fighting for the rights of people on Cape Flats. We will be seen, we will be acknowledged. Thank you, um, Honorable 
Faiz Jacobs. Uh, we appreciate your presentation. We gave you the chance to speak here because in your request, you said you were representing Cape Flats communities. And as this portfolio committee, we respect that. We can then doubt what you said to us. Apologies for that. Thank you again for your presentation. It will be integrated with all other presentation that we have received through this platform and second phase of our process. Um, thank you. We then, uh, Ms. Martinison, uh, the group that is following. Yes, Chair, we have uh, Mr. Matthew Pox from Kosato. Is, is he ready? Yes, he is, Chair, he's online. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Pax from Kosa to Western Cape, you are welcome to our portfolio committee to present your submission. Over to you, sir. <clears throat> okay, good morning, uh, honorable chair and members. Um, yes, thank you for having me. Um, I think uh, my very kind committee coordinator, Nola, will assist with um, sharing our PowerPoint presentation. My apologies. I still struggle with technology at times. So thank you to Nola. <clears throat> Just to thank members and the committee for giving us space as COSATU. Uh, my name is Matthew Parks. I'm here on behalf of COSATU um, nationally, <clears throat> including our 17 individual affiliate unions. Um, our members range across all sectors of the economy, um, from teachers and police officers, to nurses and doctors, to farm workers, to retail workers, food workers, <clears throat> etc. So I think, Chair, for us, this is an important issue. I must also say, uh, Chair, as a uh, COSATU, we've been intricately involved in the expropriation bill, both the current bill, which was at NEDLEC last year, <clears throat> but even the previous version in uh, 2013, when it was at NEDLEC, and when it also came to parliament in 2015. Um, so Chen, in short, in summary, <clears throat> as COSATU, we strongly support the expropriation bill, as well as the 18th constitutional amendment bill. And obviously the two are intricately uh, linked together. Chair, I think it's, it's, it's very important for us to remember where we come from. Um, I think as Honorable Jacobs, Honorable Dugmore spoke eloquently just now, South Africa is not a normal nation, unfortunately. We are the most unequal nation in the country. Um, and the constitution is very clear, Chair. Yes, it protects individual rights, which it must, but also speaks specifically to the obligation of the state to address the legacies of colonialism and apartheid. And these are not far-flung realities. These are the recent memories as Honorable Jacobs, I think, eloquently mentioned now. I think we must also be honest as a nation, all of us, we have fundamentally failed to advance land reform since 1994. And Chair, we don't need to be naive to know what are the dangers of not addressing land reform or eradicating the legacies of colonialism and apartheid. We simply need to look next door to our neighbors in Zimbabwe to see what is the real consequence of failing to deal with the fundamental legacies of, of oppression and colonialism. Our next slide. So Chair, I think also what's been missing in this debate, to be honest, we have an existing expropriation act from 1975. Uh, members might, be, might recall that in 1975, BJ Foster was the prime minister. It was the, heart, the height of the apartheid oppression. And obviously it can't reflect the values of the 1996 constitution, which all of us pledge allegiance to. It doesn't reflect our progressive bill of rights. Um, Chair, there is a need and the bill speaks quite progressively to it about ensuring that all of us have just an equitable access to land. And the failure for us not to do that is, is the actual real constitutional crisis. So Chair, we think as COSATO, the both bills, the expropriation and the, the constitutional amendment bills are rational interventions. And as the bill speaks very detailed too, there are just instances where nil compensation would be warranted. In fact, that is a point we had raised in our 2015 submission to Parliament as well. Our next slide. I think, yeah, I think it was slide four, Nola. <clears throat> yeah, just the next slide. I'll just go back. Yeah, that's the one. Thank you. 
Um, Chair, I think, look, also, we're not dealing with academic issues. If, any, if you go to any of our cities, you'll see that there are millions of people, largely African and colored, who are still condemned because they don't own land to live in informal areas, to live in backyard dwellings. You know, rural areas, millions of people, again, largely African and colored, and especially women, don't have land, um, in particular farm workers too. They don't have land to build homes, to farm, to build jobs or economic opportunities, to leave a legacy for the children. Unfortunately, our land ownership, in particular in agriculture, is still overwhelmingly white and male dominated. Um, next slide. Chair, we need to be honest that since 1994, despite the best intentions of the government, we have not been able to significantly eradicate their party ownership patterns. Um, the issue of compensation is a prohibitive issue at times. We saw it in about 2013, the issue of Mala Mala Game Reserve, where the owners demanded about 800 million rand from government. That was a third of the land reform budget for that year. And of course, now, Comrade Chin, honorable members, the state budget is simply overstretched. It will never have sufficient funds to address the issues. But also, Chair, there's the issue of, of morality. A party era expropriations didn't come with compensation. People who were forced out of District 6 were never paid compensation. I think we will all know the stories of people, if they were lucky to get two pounds or whatever uh, pittance they were given. So why, if I got a property in District 6, should I be given compensation now? Um, Chair, look, on, on the issue of the 18 Constitutional Amendment Bill, we think there's a variety of views on, the, on it. One school of thought says, look, it's not necessarily to amend the Constitution already provides for expropriation, including no compensation. The other school of thought, which we share, is that it's better to have clarity and to provide surety for all, to provide these amendments in this bill and in the 18th Constitutional Amendment Bill, so everybody knows exactly what is the law, provide certainty to investors, to owners across the board. Um, it also progressively places a clear responsibility upon the state to advance land reform, and they can be held accountable. It provides critically, Comrade Chair, for clear legal, legal recourse for all affected parties. Um, so we think, Chair, from our side, Section 25 and with the pending amendments provide very clear constitutional guidance for this bill. Um, next slide. Chair, as COSATO, we support the bill fully. We think the bill into the administrative processes provides a uniform, fair set uh, processes for expropriation across the country. Currently, you've got about 150 different pieces of legislation which all speak to expropriation. So here's a single tick list, which is helpful to everybody. It provides very clear checks and balances to prevent abuses by government. And for us, this is an important chair. Um, it provides very clear legal recourse and relief to anyone who's aggrieved to go to the courts on any issue from the processes to compensation, to nil conversation. And for us, Chair, this is critical because as COSATU, the majority of, of expropriation is not the sexy ones about land reform. It actually is about a municipality expropriating a teacher's house to build a freeway, a power station, a, a dam, et cetera. So it provides the right balances. And for us, we support on that, on that basis. Our next slide. Chair, also critically, and building upon the lessons we've learned since 1994, it provides very clear timeframes to, to avoid the processes being dragged out in perpetuity and thus delaying land reform and land restitution, um, but also provides for, in special cases, emergency expropriation in the event of disasters. Um, next slide. Chair, I think it's useful really to go through the bill and to go through it many times. I think that will assure a lot of people who have, we think, raised wrong fears. The bill is very clear. Government can expropriate if there's a public purpose, if there's a public interest, or to support land reform or land restitution. Those are constitutional principles. Um, it speaks to government addressing the legacies of apartheid and colonialism and specifically providing redress for those who lost property. It's not a blank check. It's a progressive, specific intervention. Um, next slide. Chair, it also speaks to the issue of transformation, about ensuring that all have access equitably to our natural resources, be it minerals, water, and land. Very importantly for, for, for labor tenants, for farm workers, for rural residents, it recognizes unregistered rights. Um, the need to, to protect those and unregistered right holders specifically. Um, it recognizes the need to provide surety for those whose land tenure still remains insecure because of apartheid colonialism. And that's an issue in both rural and urban areas. Um, next slide. So on the issue of compensation, again, the bill is very clear. 
it's not a blank check. It's not loosely worded. When you determine compensation, yes, you look at market value, but also you must look at how is the, the property acquired? What's its current usage? What's the purpose of the expropriation? What improvements had the owner done to the property? What's the public interest? And I think specifically, Chair, was also helpful is that the value of general was established not so long ago to provide a, a fair and neutral determination of property value too. So it's not just simply an exorbitant market demand. Chair, on the issue of conversation also, <clears throat> sorry, our next slide, I think I've covered that issue. Yeah. Chair, I think also for what is for us quite, quite critical is that it compels the expropriating authorities and the affected parties to engage, to table offers, to see if they can find a consensus, et cetera. But in the event of a failure to find consensus, any party has got the right to go to court to seek relief. And the courts will be guided by this bill and the 18th Constitutional Amendment Bill. So what are the criteria? Is government correct? Is the affected party correct? What is the right outcome? And of course, our courts are very robust and vigorous. They're not um, puppy dogs of government. We think it provides a correct balance between the state's administrative functions and the legal oversight and, and relief of the courts. And so we support it. Um, next slide. So on the issue of new conversation, again, I think, unfortunately, and, and look, we're a noisy democracy, so that's fine. People have the right to their views. Um, but at times, the hysteria doesn't help us. The no conversation provisions are quite specific in the bill. Um, and again, in the 18th Constitutional Amendment Bill as well. And we think the bill is in line with the Constitutional Amendment Bill. Um, next slide. So, so Chair, when it says no conversation, it speaks specifically to five instances. It speaks to idle private land. And again, we know across our cities, there are countless pieces of land which are idle, unutilized, which could be used for housing, et cetera. It speaks to idle state land. Again, Chair, we've got countless instances where the state is, is the owner of about 30% of our land and often departments, parastatals, municipalities are sitting on huge tracts of land and have no intention of, of developing it. Why should government have to compensate another government entity for land? We had a similar instance a few years ago in Cape Town where the city of Cape Town demanded a huge amount from national government for land it was not utilizing. Chair, we all know that there are countless pieces of land which have been abandoned by the owners, whether it's in downtown Johannesburg, it's in Cape Town where owners have gone to Australia or wherever, they've got no interest, yet municipalities are struggling to find land to build housing. Um, Chair, there are also people who have unfairly benefited because of state investments next to their property. And of course, we've got property which poses a risk to the environment, to health and safety, or to other pe people's properties. So it's not a blank check, it's those five instances. Um, so Chair, our support as COSATU for the bill is based upon that it compels the state to advance land reform, to address the legacies of apartheid and colonialism. Um, it power, empowers the state to utilize expropriation to accelerate land reform. Um, that also capacitates the state to offer compensation, whether it's full or partial or nil, and under very clear circumstances, and it says when they can do it. Um, it'll, it'll be a useful tool for us, Chair, for workers or the public to hold the state legally accountable to driving land reform. Um, next slide. Chair, we believe as COSATA, the bill is in line with international norms. There is no country in the world which does not have an expropriation act of some sort, even the US, Europe, et cetera. Um, we feel the chair, the bill does provide adequate protection to workers and their houses and their cars, the small holdings from arbitrary abuses. It provides very clear checks and balances, clear timeframes. And of course, we have to emphasize it the clear legal recourse for any aggrieved party to seek relief from the courts. Um, next slide. So Chair, there are two types of opposition to this bill. There's a very reactionary kind of right-wing populist opposition. It's hysterical to be honest. It's not speaking to facts. It's not speaking to the content of the bill. Um, we feel unfortunately, whether by intent or default, it in effect seeks to preserve the legacies of colonialism and apartheid. Um, Chair, for us, this is a sensitive issue. Land will always be a sensitive issue wherever you are, all countries. And that's why we need to have common rational engagements to find how can we find each other. But the hysterical opposition doesn't do that. It starves the opportunity for us to have rational discussions. And the bill is rational. But Chair, again, we have to emphasize, if we don't deal with the land reform issues and the legacies of apartheid and colonialism, we are a ticking time bomb. And again, 
Let's look at Zimbabwe of the consequences of ignoring issues. Um, next slide. So you do have also on the other side of the political spectrum, some uh, populist opposition to the bill, which again is hysterical and not factual. Um, it fails to recognize that there is a need to protect the rights of ordinary workers. And these workers' rights are often abused by corrupt municipal and departmental officials who would love to go and expropriate a house and then to flip it in an auction later. It happens in the banks all the time when, when people's houses are repossessed. Um, and again, we feel this bill provides the necessary protections to prevent abuses in future. It, it protects workers, it'll capacitate the state. We think it actually, it will accelerate economic growth and job creation. Um, next slide. I'm just getting to the end, honorable chair. Um, chair, I think also we don't want to allow government to get off the hook. There are many other land reform um, bills which have been delayed for quite a few years by government. This bill will be a useful tool in the step forward, but it's not a silver bullet. It won't resolve everything. We, we do have the 18th Constitutional Amendment Bill, which is now being processed. But Chair, the previous parliament failed to pass the Restitution of Land Rights Amendment Bill, which was going to reopen the 1939 claims of five years. It hasn't been revived. Government must still table the Regulation Land Holding Bill. It must still table the Communal Land Tenure Bill. It is welcome that uh, the Department of Justice is indicating they're going to table the Land Claims Court Bill quite soon. Um, the Preservation and Development of Agricultural Land Bill, which will it's quite critical to preserving agricultural land for agriculture. That has left Nedlac and should come to Parliament soon. But sure, even when bills have been passed, like the Extension of Security of Tenure Amendment Act, which was passed about five years ago, many of these provisions protecting farm workers from unfair evictions haven't been implemented yet. But sure, legislation is one point. The other thing is if you want to support emerging black farmers, then government and the private sector need to give support. And that includes access to financing, to training, to materials like seeds and fertilizers, machinery. It includes access to electricity, to water. Um, it's about getting transport for the goods to the markets. It's about the, the retailer sector providing affordable prices to those farmers and about having affordable insurance. Land on its own is not going to ensure a successful farmer. Even farmers like your old Afrikaner farmers who have been doing this for hundreds of years, it's a tough battle. We need to give support to new emerging black farmers. Um, next slide and the last slide, Chair. Oh, so just go back. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Nola. Um, so in conclusion, Comrade Chair, I hope I didn't take too long, but I think as Kosatu and our individual unions want to say we support the expropriation bill. We are confident it will stand constitutional muster. We would welcome anybody seeking to, to confirm that with the constitutional court. We think it's aligned with the constitution and the international norms. It's a rational and it's a fair and it's an equitable compromise, Chair. Um, it compels and empowers government to accelerate land reform, to address the legacies of apartheid and colonialism, but equally, Chair, it provides a fair balance of protection for affected parties, all parties, and in particular workers. So in conclusion, Comrade Chair, we want to thank you for giving us space as Kofatu to raise our views, and we'd like to urge Parliament to pass this progressive bill. Thank you, Honourable Chair Members. Thank you, Mr. Pax, uh, who was presenting on behalf of COSA2. Uh, I now invite honorable members to comment, to ask questions of clarity on the presentations. Honorable Franz Calve. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you to Mr. Fox for the clear presentation that has been made. Chairperson, Mr. Parks uh, mentioned that uh, he is representing uh, about 17 affiliated unions. Can you give us an indication of approximately how many individuals these uh, uh, affiliates represent and uh, COSATU at large as a national uh, uh, federation? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, uh, Honorable Franz Kalvik. Uh, no other hand, uh, over to you, Mr. Pax. Okay. No, no, thanks very much, uh, Chair and Honorable Franz Kalvik. Um, look, <clears throat> I don't want to be uh, boastful, Honorable Chair, um, but outside of the Zionist Christian Church in South Africa, um, COSATU is the largest organization in the country. Our membership is about 1.7 million members. Um, they come across from every sector of the economy. Um, so they would include parliamentary staff, it would include police and prison officers, teachers, 
um, workers at shop rights, it will include farm workers, etc. So our membership is about 1.7 million other different unions. But beyond that chair, a mother who is a nurse has got two or three dependents. Um, in this time of job losses, they will support increasingly large numbers of relatives. Um, the immediate family of those 1.7 million workers will be about 12 million people. Um, Chair, they come across not only from all sectors of the economy, but all races, all genders. Um, it's an extremely diverse organization. So our Clothing and Textile Workers Union, which has about 120,000 members, is a largely colored and African women's trade union in the, in the Cape Flats, Cape Town, but also in KZN, Free State, Gauteng, et cetera. So it's a very diverse organization. Chair, we have members who own houses, like teachers who want to know, is a property secured? And we can assure them, yes, the property is secured. But we also have um, about three unions which organize farm workers and food workers. And they want to know, will they ever have a chance to own agricultural land, to put their skills of plowing the land, to have a small holding, to, have, to grow food for the families and maybe one day sell their food in the town market. And we can assure, yes, this bill will assist in that process. So um, that's why, Chair, for us as Kusat, we always try to find a pragmatic balance, a compromise, which attracts everybody because we are a diverse organization. Um, our members are desperate for land, for housing in the cities, for farming in the rural areas. But our members also want to see checks and in the government to prevent abuses in the future. And again, we can say, yes, this bill does prevent those abuses. And of course, Chair, members might be shocked, but uh, our members are very sensitive to the issues of the economy, to the issues of investors. Our members work in the banking sector, they work in the manufacturing, the mining sectors. And they think this is a actual provide certainty to investors to say, okay, South Africa, this is your expropriation law. These are the conditions. These are the checks and balances. They know exactly where we stand and what are their rights, et cetera. And I think, Chair, for us, this is a win-win compromise for all affected parties. But if you don't grab this opportunity with, and embrace it, we're going to allow a cancerous sore to fester and grow until one day we will collapse and explode like Zimbabwe. And that is not going to benefit anybody in this country. But once again, thank you, Honorable Chair, and thank you, members, for giving us space. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Pax, and, and your presentation, which is very clear, with clear recommendations. We really appreciate that. Uh, we will uh, integrate your presentation with other presentation and discuss as a committee. Uh, we, we now uh, invite um, it's it's two organizations, though they have be, been given the same time, Business Unity South Africa, BUSA, and Agricultural Business Chamber. I think they are together. Um, I have not been informed who is going to present on behalf of these two organizations. Honorable Chairperson, it's Mr. Theo Boshoff and Mr. Olifay Sirao. They will be doing a joint presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ms. Martinez. You are welcome, gentlemen. Uh, the one who is supposed to start can start now. The floor is yours. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, uh, honorable members uh, and colleagues, and thank you so much for the opportunity afforded us uh, to present our views on the expropriation bill. Uh, I represent uh, BUSA, that's Business Unity South Africa, and my colleague uh, Tio Bosov uh, represents uh, AGBUS, that's the Agricultural Business Chamber. Uh, to say a few words about BUSA, we're a confederation of business organizations, and that includes uh, chambers of commerce and industry, professional associations, corporates, as well as unisex organizations. Uh, we represent a, a cross spectrum of South African business, uh, both large and small, across the economy, on macroeconomic and cross-cutting policies and issues that affect business at the national and international levels. Through the unparalleled reach of our membership, BUSA represents the overwhelming majority of South African business. Our function is to ensure that business plays a constructive role in the country's economic growth, development, and transformation, and to ensure an environment in which businesses of all sizes and in all sectors can thrive, expand, and be competitive. As the principal representative of business in South Africa, BUSA represents the views of its members in a number of national and international structures and bodies, both statutory and non-statutory. 
Bursa is the official representative of organized business at NEDLAC. Regarding the NEDLAC process, we participated in an extensive process at NEDLAC with several of our members, including AGBIS, serving in our delegation. Whereas we will in this presentation rehearse the position we articulated at NEDLAC, I nevertheless encourage honorable members to study the NEDLAC report in detail, should they not yet have had an opportunity to do so. With that, Chair, I'll hand over to my colleague, Tio, to continue the presentation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, honorable members and esteemed guests, a privilege to be able to present. So, uh, as my colleague Olivia mentioned, my name is Theo Wasser from, from the Agricultural Business Chamber. So we are an association of businesses in the agricultural value chain, uh, predominantly companies who do business with primary agriculture and who finance primary agriculture. We're also a member of, of BUSA, which is, which is why we are conducting a co-presentation. Um, so Chairperson, if, I, I hope that everyone can see the presentation. Perhaps just to articulate, we, we have a very long history with this bill. Um, and I think as, as our colleagues from Labour uh, also have done, we wish to speak to the contents of the bill, specifically because we have been involved with the bill from roughly 2013. So we may have some recommendations, uh, mostly emanating from a position in the NETLAC report and perhaps certain um, provisions of the, of the bill, which we don't 100% agree with. But I want to emphasize overall that we do support the need for this bill. I mean, as, as was mentioned, um, property owners, as the state, as well as, as bondholders, currently rely on a 1975 Act to for a fair procedure, which, uh, which certainly is, is not uh, a suitable status quo. So we do support the bill in, in principle, and we would definitely recognize there's a need for the bill. We also want to just re-emphasize that um, we do support transformation and land reform. We're also very act actively involved in land reform. However, the bill does go slightly beyond merely expropriation for land reform purposes, which is why I can't of we focus on the, on the detailed process as well. Um, finance, I just want to say we must applaud the department and, and other social partners for the processes followed to date, which really, really has been quite inclusive and uh, good discussions. So we, we hope that um, we can assist as well in this regard today. So Chair, firstly, potential emissions from the bill. We, we had a discussion at NetLAC. Unfortunately, the terms of reference did not, pro, did not permit us to make any additions to the bill. However, it was proposed that perhaps we must uh, make put this to, to, to the portfolio committee. So essentially the emission that we can spot from the bill is, is the situation where property is expropriated and expropriation can no longer be withdrawn as per section 23.2. So in other words, after three months or if land is registered or the compensation has already been paid and we do agree with those provisions. But what happens when the property is no longer required for the original purpose? So of course, um, if a new purpose is in the public interest or it is not in the public interest or for public purpose, it does, by not addressing this aspect, that the bill is open for, for potential attack, which, which we believe is something, you know, or litigation, which is something perhaps a loophole which might need to be closed. Of course, if it's expropriated for a specific public purpose or public interest, but it is then used for, for an alternative purpose, which is also in the public interest or purpose, the expropriation might be valid. However, the amount of compensation may need to be adjusted, especially considering that the purpose of the expropriation also does play a role in calculating compensation. So a recommendation from our side chairperson is, is we don't believe it's realistically feasible to try to reverse an expropriation where the property is no longer required for, for that public purpose or public interest. Um, simply put, to collect all the compensation from all of the, you know, the owner as well as all the rights holders who were compensated and to try to reinstate rights that have now been extinguished. Mortgage bonds would have a cost to reinstate and unregistered rights might be very difficult to, to reinstate. So we don't believe it's feasible to try to reverse an expropriation in this unlikely event. So an alternative, more real, more sort of pragmatic approach that we propose is to put a right of first refusal in favor of the owner. However, the owner must pay the full amount of compensation paid out to all potential beneficiaries who receive compensation. So it does open the possibility that um, the owner, if he does exercise that right, will pay more than the compensation he received, but that should be offset by the fact of uh, the property is, is, is then bought without a mortgage bond, for example, it's no longer encumbered. But there should, but this should be very strict, strictly time bound. Uh, we proposed a you know, period of roughly 30 days and if no response is received from the owner, then the authority should be free to use or dispose of the property according to its own needs or its, or its own internal asset management policies. 
Chairperson, and then I think the next section we want to zoom in on is the definition of expropriation. So know that the constitution does not currently provide for the, for the definition of expropriation, however, the bill does. Now, expropriation, generally and internationally speaking, it's regarded as a form of deprivation. Now, some of that might be slightly legalistic, but deprivation is permitted under the constitution, and it, it basically entails any state action that limits your use of enjoyment of the property is deprivation, but it is permitted as long as it's not arbitrary. A simple example of, of, of requiring you may be the owner of a car, but you, but you must have a driver's license to operate the car. That's a deprivation, but it is reasonable, it is justifiable, and it's not arbitrary, so it is permitted and no compensation needs to be paid. Typically, a deprivation will only be regarded as an expropriation if it goes on to that extreme form of deprivation where compensation needs to be paid, where in other words, the, the rights are, um, have been downgraded to such an extent that it's that it's just difficult to, to pay compensation. Now, the bold current definition sets a threshold of acquisition. So in other words, a deprivation will only become an expropriation if the state acquires uh, the property in question. So this is in line with the Agri-SA constitutional court case, which said that there's no um, expropriation unless there's an acquisition However, there's also alternative case law, the, the Aaron case that also served before the Constitutional Court, where it said in certain instances, a constructive expropriation is possible. In other words, even though it is not mentioned or named as an expropriation, they might be um, just, justifiable to pay compensation if the rights are limited to such an extent that, it's, that it really loses all of its value. And Chairperson, in South Africa, I think especially with regards to communal occupiers who are really living in, on state land, the, there is an unintended consequence with this with this definition. If I can present it in a different way, one could almost think about deprivation and expropriation as two sides of the same coin, or almost on, on one continuum. But with a definition that states that it is only once the state acquires the rights that it becomes an expropriation, one of the challenges is when rights in property are, um, are extinguished, it might not be regarded as expropriation and a person would not be entitled to compensation uh, unless the state actually acquired that, those rights. Now, within the South African context, especially a lot of, we, we know that there's a huge percentage, roughly a third of our population living on state land, especially in the communal areas. And we, we do fear that those rights might be able to be extinguished, but it would not be regarded as an expropriation because the state does not acquire the property. In fact, the state already owns the, the formal title deed. So there's no acquisition and therefore no expropriation and therefore no compensation paid. So this is a potential loophole in the definition which, which we, we have identified and which we believe should perhaps be addressed. So our recommendation now to prove how to address this is as follows. And this is a definition we put forward in NetLAC as well. Is that expropriation means a compulsory acquisition of a property, which is a current definition, or a right in property, specifically with our land rights, but, the, but those living on the land do not necessarily own the property by an expropriating authority or an organ of state upon request to an expropriating authority, including a deprivation of ownership or right in property that is materially equivalent to a compulsory acquisition. And an expropriate has a corresponding meaning. So this we believe should be able to close that gap to ensure that those people who, whose rights may be extinguished or whose rights may be severely limited, but it falls short of the state acquiring the rights should also be entitled to some form of compensation. In the next uh, section, Chairperson, we'd like to draw the um, committee's attention to is Clause 2.2, which requires the administrative authority um, responsible for an organ of state to consent to the expropriation of land from a state entity. So this should be read with Section 12.3b, the no compensation provision, which, which mentions that land belonging to a state entity can be um, or may be eligible for no compensation, provided it is not uh, required for that organ of state's own purposes. Now, Chairperson, the question can be raised whether or not this is in fact expropriation, because the concept of, of expropriation is without consent. Um, and we are also concerned that perhaps there might be double standards in, in terms of that a private landowner, his consent is not required. However, if the state entity's land is required, then the consent of the administrative authority might be required. So then our proposal would be that this should not be legislated, it should rather be dealt with um, an intergovernmental relations framework act, where there is a conflict for conflicting interests for this land. The risk that one has by legislating, um, by, by including this in, in the legislation, is it automatically places the purpose of expropriation inferior to, the, to whatever purpose the organ of state might require it for. 
So for example, if it's if there is a land claim um, over a national park and it cannot be and, and the dispute cannot be settled in terms of the Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act, automatically it places conservation as a higher priority than land reform. If, if, because the, um, that, that, uh, if, if it does get to the point where, where, for, where, for instance, the Minister of Environmental Affairs does not consent to it being transferred. So we don't believe that should be uh, included in legislation. It should rather be dealt with um, outside of legislation. Jabez and Ming Clause 3.2, expropriation on behalf of the organ of state by the Minister of Public Works. So we note that it says that the minister must expropriate property if satisfied that the property is required by the organ of state for public purpose. So Chair, we understand and, and we agree with the fact that the, the minister must or should have powers to expropriate on behalf of an organ of state. For example, ESCOM, um, if, if land is required for power lines or power station. However, we are concerned that the word must might place an undue obligation on the state it, because it limits the discretion of, of the minister. In other words, the minister can only refuse to expropriate it if he's not satisfied that it's needed in the public interest or public purpose. There might be other reasons why the expropriation cannot take place at the current time, for example, budgetary constraints. So we would propose that this must should be changed to, to May simply to um, allow the, the minister slightly more discretion so if exterior or, or alternative reasoning comes, it comes into play that they might not be able to expropriate it in, in a given financial year, that the minister has a discretion to say we will not expropriate at this stage, but may expropriate perhaps in the, in the following financial year. So effectively, this just protects the state from incurring obligations that perhaps it cannot afford at the time. But it still provides a discretion to, to allow for it. So then clause seven, the notice of intention to expropriate. Now this, this deals really with the, the procedural elements of it. When you went through the bill and look at all the, the various notices that must be given, the state does not make the first offer of compensation. After the intention, the notice of intention to expropriate is delivered, the owner must furnish, according to section 74A, must submit a claim for compensation. And that claim must set out full particulars in terms of how the compensate, amount of compensation is made up. Now, fundamentally, we believe under section 25 of the constitution, there's a difference between the value of the property and the compensation, which a specific owner might be entitled to. So we believe it might be unfair, especially in light of some of the more qualitative elements, the purpose of the expropriation, policy decisions, the history of the acquisition for the owner to make the first claim, because it's not sure if the owner is supposed to factor these into um, its claim, you know, here's a her claim for compensation and exactly how this, shall, how this should be done. So we believe this can be remedied by recognizing a difference between value and compensation. So just in summary, Chair, I mean, the value relates to the, to the quantitative inherent profit, um, characteristics of the property, whereas compensation has to take the value into consideration, but includes external and additional considerations. It relates to the circumstances of a specific owner, and it's qualitative. How the owner um, obtained the property, for example, won't affect what that property is worth, but it will affect the compensation that should be paid to the owner. So Jay, we propose that we recognize that distinction in the procedure and in the process rather require the owner or the holder to, to just to submit details um, outlining what, what he or she believes the value of the property is. And then the expropriating authority should consider this value and then apply any qualitative factors to make the offer of compensation. Again, um, drawing the emphasis between difference between value and compensation. And there is some international um, examples that can be followed. For um, If we looked at the Land and Acquisition and Compensation Act of, of the state of Victoria in Australia, there it says quite simply that the, the offer must set out the amount that the authority and all available information available to it has assessed as a fair and reasonable estimate of the amount of compensation payable um, under this act. However, um, if you look at subsection five, the authority must have regard to evaluation of the land carried out by the valuer general, which Australia also has a valuer general like South Africa has. We believe this will assist to try and manage expectations, um, both from the state as well as the owner on both parties, to draw that distinction so that the owner should submit details of value, but then the authority must be clear when making the offer of compensation that the value of the property was considered, but it's not net, but there might be alternative considerations which allows it to deviate from the value. Um, and, and those considerations should be unique to that owner or, or that bondholder's unique circumstances. 
I believe this will also assist our courts in, in um, if it does finally get to the uh, dispute or litigation on compensation to try to make a better informed decision to see where some of the amounts came from. Chair, then we get, of course, to section 12.3, so the expropriation at, at nil compensation. So, Chair, we, we understand and I think we recognize that it's not an automatic nil compensation. It says it may be nil compensation after um, considering all relevant circumstances. However, we, we, we do question why these properties specifically were singled out, uh, as they might have un caused unintended consequences. Um, we note that the bill, of course, is not limited to land reform, but believe that this provision is predominantly aimed at land reform. And there, I think the, the premise that land reform is too expensive, compensation is paid. Uh, believe that if one does look at how the budget is used, um, the evaluations that are conducted, and, and we agree with some of the previous speakers that we do have a history that must be addressed in terms of the state has overpaid for certain property, and, and that certainly can be addressed. However, to jump automatically to no compensation, we believe might be... Um, an extreme example. Uh, the, 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 the principle of just and equitable compensation for land hasn't been adequately tested and we believe that um, expropriation is of course a part of the toolkit to affect land reform. However, what is just and equitable for land reform hasn't been adequately tested and perhaps should be tested in extreme cases. So in other words, where voluntary sales or, um, or shares, share equity schemes um, with the willing participants, the state always has the right to expropriate and believe that that should be used. However, to jump straight to null compensation might be skipping a number of alternative possibilities as well. And I can just maybe mention as well that the business sector, uh, we are working closely with government to develop a blended finance scheme. In other words, to make, to mix grant funding with commercial loan funding from the private sector to try and make more private sector capital also available to co-finance land reform. So these are a range of alternatives, I think, which we should use to accelerate land reform and, and, and land reform must certainly be accelerated. Uh, where expropriation is part of the toolkit, I bet it's probably not the only mechanism that should be used. Just on the specific provisions, Chairperson, um, so some of the unintended consequences that, that we can see by listing categories of properties as potentially no compensation is it might affect the collateral value of this land and it might almost become branded as, as no-go areas for either investment or, um, or to use to obtain credit, which, which we believe will, you know, kind of, can be an unintended consequence. Uh, the cost and access to credit for these properties might automatically be increased um, or it might become a challenge when it's listed. Just to comment on some of the specifics, Joe. Um, so the land that's not being used um, for its main benefit, it's only only being used on to speculative value to increase in market value. So not, I think the rationale is somewhat unclear if one compares it to purchasing shares on, on the stock exchange. I mean, the intention there is, is simply for it to increase in value. So we're not sure why the two asset classes are treated def differently. Um, perhaps it's, it could be due to a hoarding of natural resources or scarcity of land. If that's the case, then I think perhaps it might be more understandable, but it's not very clearly um, explained. So also just to note, there might be legitimate justifications why a property cannot be developed at a certain time. It might be waiting for permissions from a municipality or lack of finance, for example. So this should also just be factored in. I think the land acquired by an organ of state, I think that has already been dealt with. Next provision, Chair. So um, if only abandoned land by failing to exercise control. So once again, there may be legitimate reasons why why you cannot exercise control despite trying to exercise control. And there has been court cases, the Mordeklip Buda case, for example, where damages were awarded because the municipality failed to assist an owner to, to retain control of the property during land invasion. So there should always be room for, for exceptions um, with legitimate purposes. Uh, another unintended consequence is perhaps is it talks about the owner's intention, which is linked to no compensation. But we know many of these abandoned buildings uh, in the CBD of, of, of a lot of the metros, the owner may have abandoned control. However, there are multiple families living in, a, living, um, you know, in, in these houses and they would be the holder of unregistered rights. So there might be a disconnect between, they might not have, um, or, or the holders of unregistered rights in the property may not have abandoned uh, the intention you know, to have a, a relationship with a property. So no compensation might not be justified in that instance. It looks only at the, the owner's intention. And then finally, the subsidies. Uh, we believe this is already catered for under section, section 12, one, as well as section 25, three of the constitution. Um, the only unintended consequence that once again might be that land reform beneficiaries could threaten their security of tenure. 
as a lot of land reform um, properties has been 100% purchased by the state and financed by the state. So there the extent of state subsidies might exceed the value of the property. So I, we don't know if that's the intention, but it might be an unintended consequence. In other words, that the state could then reclaim the land with, without compensation. So that is one thing that must be, I think, guard, guarded against for the sake of those beneficiaries. Chair Fani, where the property poses a health risk. So um, we just want to draw the attention that we mustn't confuse the compensation element with the reason for expropriation. So there might be, and I'm sure there is numerous municipal bylaws that, uh, that do exist that deals with um, penalties and, and remedies for when a property does pose a health risk. So when, a, so in other words, by listing it under 12.3, this doesn't automatically entitle the state to expropriate it. It simply means that the compensation might be affected. So there where property is acquired for a different purpose, for example, for low cost housing, for a public interest purpose, then the actual costs required to repair should apply, not necessarily no compensation. I believe that might be more rational. So labor tenants, uh, we do, I think the 12.3.4's latest, the latest version is a vast improvement on the previous versions because it does clarify that the claims must first be processed before land can be acquired. And then unfortunately, we, um, a large part of the holdup in land labor tenant claims has actually been the lag in the administrative process, not necessarily uh, the land acquisition. So unfortunately, um, whilst it's an incredibly important thing to, to rectify, there is, is additional things that may be required outside of this, this legislation to accelerate labor tenants claims and the process and thereof. Chair, so then I think just two more substantive provisions. So the payment of amount um, offered as compensation. So it does, section 17.3 does state that a delay in the payment of compensation will not prevent possession from passing. And we, so the constitution does state that the time and manner of payment must be just and equitable. And we do note that the Huffage constitutional court case did permit um, possession to be passed to the state um, before the um, full amount of compensation was paid. But it must be emphasized that the court did say it was just and equitable in that instance, because it would prejudice the state otherwise to do so. So we would just uh, motivate including that right in terms of it might not in all circumstances be just and equitable. So we would motivate adding to the end of 17.3 where it is just and equitable to do so in line of section 25.3 of the constitution. Finally, 17.3 also refers to delay in payment by virtue of subsection two, which, which we understand those are legitimate cases where there will be a delay in, in payment of compensation or any other dispute. So to these other end of disputes, we're a little bit um, cautious about that it shouldn't be open-ended. We understand section 18, 19, and 20 is quite clear cases where there might be a delay in the payment of constitution, but it, excuse me, compensation, but it should be limited to those instances. So we would motivate deleting any other dispute. So then the final substantive, substantive point is clause 29 allows um, certain legal documents, steps in the processes to be deemed valid where there was non-compliance with the procedure. So the expropriation bill, in essence, is about procedure. It's a procedural bill. Where there are bona fide mistakes that have been made and there's no prejudice to either party, we're certainly not opposed to that being condoned. It shouldn't invalidate the whole process. Our only question is, is who decides, and the bill is not entirely clear in terms of who decides whether or not um, there is material, whether there is prejudice, or whether non-compliance with a specific provision was material or not. So to rectify this, we would propose that there should either be agreement between the parties um, to, to condone non-compliance with, with certain procedures, or failing that where, there's, where the parties can't agree, um, reach agreement, an application should be made for con to, to a court for condemnation so that the court can confirm that it is in fact immaterial and doesn't prejudice anyone. So Chair, just in conclusion, the current expropriation legislation certainly is not adequate for um, given our, our, our constitutional dem democracy. So the new legislation is vitally needed. Uh, there's, 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 there's no question about that. We are broadly supportive of the, of the provisions of the bill. We do believe that the majority of it is world class. However, we do uh, we are concerned that, about the null compensation provisions and, and uh, the effect it may have, in, have on investor confidence and finance. So I think communication campaign as well, um, and perhaps looking at that wording might assist to um, just to, con to allay the fears of investors. And we hope that perhaps some of our other comments on the procedure would be would assist the, the committee in its deliberations. Chairperson and members, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boshoff. And 
uh, for your presentation. Uh, I now invite um, honorable members for clarity seeking questions. Honorable members. Uh, my my question or comment, if you may uh, take it, is that uh, as people who are part of NEDLEC and before this bill was taken to cabinet, I think it was with you, you discussed at length uh, many of the clauses that are there. And then, uh, today again you are coming here. Is it because what you proposed when it was discussed in cabinet, it fell off? Or you want to ensure that what you proposed has to see the light even in this platform? Remember you had the platform before, you are coming back again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. If, if, if I may um, respond to that, yeah. So, so um, correct. We we did have the platform to um, to discuss, and so, so so many of these were discussed in that. Like, for example, the uh, the definition. We couldn't reach agreement on on the definition. So, so that is why we are again raising it on, on this platform. Um, other provisions as well, and, and some of our other comments. Um, we must admit we came under only came under attention post the NetLab process. Um, so some of the specific comments on, on section 12 through only came to attention post, posted as well as the, the potential delay in paying compensation and to provide the rider that it must be just and equitable to, to delay compensation. So that we were only, we only discovered that only were made aware of that post the NetLab process. And then to finally, I think the, the one big exception was this potential emission from the bull. So in other words, to regulate what happens when the property is, is expropriated, but is no longer required for that purpose. We, we raised the issue at NETLAC, but unfortunately the terms of reference at NETLAC only permitted us to engage on the, uh, the text that was, that was proposed, did not, did not permit us to engage on new proposals or new ins proposed insertions into the bill. So there I believe uh, it was agreed at NETLAC and, and, and the other constituencies also recommended at NETLAC that we perhaps raise this to, to the portfolio committee since um, the terms of reference at NETLAC would not permit us to, to raise it there. I think that broadly summarizes it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Mr. Boshoff and, and your organization um, for your presentation and your input. It will be integrated with other input and presentation and we'll discuss as the committee later on. We are now uh, going to invite uh, the National House of Traditional Leaders which will be represented by Nkosi Sipo Mashangu. Over to you, Mshagazi. Thank you, uh, Chairperson uh, of the committee. Uh, greetings to honorable members of the committee and also to my colleagues uh, that have joined um, this presentation and those uh, other participants that have uh, uh, presented. Um, maybe, Chair, I will start by qualifying um, who the National House represents as I've listened to other members uh, that were presenting or other presenters. I think um, as the House, we are a statutory body um, that represents 882 uh, traditional communities throughout the country with approximately uh, 10,000 villages and about uh, just over a third uh, of the population um, um, in this country. Those are people that the institution of traditional leadership is responsible for. And our role uh, as the National House is to promote uh, the role of the institution within a democratic dispensation. Uh, it's also to, uh, one of our objectives is to deal with matters relating to traditional leadership uh, the role of traditional leaders, customary law, and the customs of communities observing a system of customary law, and also to be the voice of um, 
uh, traditional communities. Um, we make uh, submissions uh, on this uh, expropriation bill of which we support um, as an institution uh, of traditional leadership in terms of background, uh, property rights, that, that is rights of individuals to own land, houses and assets are important uh, to democratic rights as enshrined in the constitution under the Bill of Rights. Traditional communities with traditional land use rights could be expropriated and their land turned over for other purposes by organs of state with no redress for the loss of their property. If the bill is passed into law in its current form, communal land is likely to become uh, uh, one of those uh, pieces uh, that will be expropriated. In terms of uh, the preamble uh, on clause 25.3c, it provides for the amount of compensation and the time and manner of payment to be just and equitable, reflecting an equitable balance between the public interest and the interest of those affected. Having regard to all relevant circumstances, including amongst others, the market value of the property. The house is of the view that it should be ascertained as to how the property was acquired by the current holder uh, in its first instance. If the acquisition was unlawful as a result of dispossession, what justifies the prerequisite for the market value of the property for compensation? It may be argued as to what compensation is for. I think we need to remember that um, dispossession was very painful. Uh, many people were killed, uh, many people have died. So yeah, I think we feel that um, um, you know, there might not be any need for compensation. So if we talk about just and equitable compensation, we should bear in mind of the past access and unlimited use of natural resources such as water, land, soil, and vegetation that has enriched the previously and currently advantaged individuals. Therefore, just and equitable compensation should take into account the fact that the previously advantaged individuals benefited freely from the resources at hand. Just and equitable compensation should also take into account the previously disadvantaged individuals or HDIs who are currently under the employment of whatever nature or survive from the activities of the property holder. This could be farm workers or any other beneficiaries of the property holder who should undoubtedly be considered for an equitable share uh, of compensation. Emphasis is hereby placed on clauses 25.4a, 6 and 7 of the preamble, which are very important in as far as the bill is concerned. In terms of clause one definition, uh, the bill defines property as property contemplated in section 25 of the constitution. The house recommends that property which may be expropriated must be defined clearly in the bill. In terms of the bill, property is not limited to the land and includes the right in such property. This definition can include mining rights, movable property and unregistered customary and other land use rights. The minister has the power to expropriate any property anywhere and approve the purchase price thereof. It therefore means that the minister will have the right to expropriate any item or property such as a house or, or a car and then determine the price as long as the correct procedures are followed. The bill must clearly state that communal land that is land owned by the community under traditional leadership is exempted from such um, uh, expropriation. Uh, in terms of unregistered rights, uh, it means that is a right in property, including a right to occupy or use land which is recognized and protected by law, but is neither registered nor required to be registered. These include the rights of tenants to occupy properties under lease agreements, the rights of farmers, and also the communal land use rights held by people living on land in traditional communities. The houses of the view that expropriation of third party rights must comply uh, with the constitution. In terms of uh, uh, clause two, um, uh, that relates to the application um, of the act, that is clause two, uh, subsection two. Uh, the house does, does acknowledge the fact that there must be an agreement for expropriation but is worried that it would appear an agreement is highly emphasized uh, as a prerequisite for expropriation. The fundamental, fundamental question to be asked is why the necessity of expropriation? 
what happened to the willing buyer, willing seller approach. In terms of clause two, three, that deals with powers of the minister, which is which also extend to expropriating uh, authority. We are of the view that only the minister should have the power to expropriate property and that the definition of expropriating authority should exclude organs of state since municipalities, government departments will be able to use the bill to further uh, their own interest. I think uh, departments uh, are run by officials and sometimes there would be competing interest with the uh, uh, public interest. In terms of clause three, uh, that deals with powers of the minister of public works, uh, that is clause three, uh, subsection 5D, uh, which deals with costs which must be paid, uh, uh, which must be paid um, uh, to the uh, uh, thing, uh, or that covers the, the, the uh, expropriation uh, uh, action. I think uh, traditional councils or structures of traditional leadership are an organ of state which are seriously underfunded. Uh, it will make it very difficult uh, for these traditional councils uh, to refund the minister for costs that have been incurred uh, for expropriation. So we would plead that maybe a dispensation for transfer to a traditional council that cannot afford to pay uh, be drafted. And only those traditional councils that can um, uh, afford to pay be allowed uh, to pay. I think we are busy now working on a program called Investor, and it would need um uh, uh, you know for us to decongest some of the traditional councils for us to be able to implement that and i think uh, many traditional councils might not be able to afford if there is any land that has been um, um expropriated uh, on their behalf that is to pay for the costs for that expropriation but whatever that would be done it would be done for the benefit of the people um uh, that belong to that uh, traditional uh, community in terms of clause five that deals with investigation and gathering of information for purposes of expropriation. Um, <clears throat> and clause 52A, which provides for the expropriating authority to authorize any person uh, if the property is lent to enter upon, upon the property at all reasonable times, as may be agreed to by the owner or occupier of the property. The National House submit that the protection of some sort is necessary. Uh, or a prerequisite for any person authorized to enter and access properties in order to perform duties associated with this act. If this matter is left as it is, it may be a danger to those who will be performing such uh, duties. And I think we've seen how other people are treated when it comes uh, to expropriating um, uh, properties. In terms of uh, clause five, um, um, uh, subsection five A, uh, the National House is of the view that um, the 20 day period uh, to submit the required information by the persons holding unreg unregistered rights may be too short. So we therefore um, uh, propose that uh, sufficient time, maybe uh, up to three months uh, be provided uh, for such a purpose. Uh, in terms of clause, clause, uh, clause seven, that deals with the notice on intention to expropriate. Uh, that is, uh, we make submissions on clause seven, subsection 4A. Um, and, and I think uh, members would be aware uh, what that clause states and uh, our proposal as the house is that the sentence should read as follows. Uh, open quote, the amount claimed by him or her as just an equitable compensation and furnishing all particulars as to how the amount is made up uh, as well, that is, uh, this is the insertion, as well as to whether he or she benefited from the property uh, for how long and in what monetary terms, uh, close uh, quote. That is in terms of clause seven, uh, subsection seven B, Roman figure three, um, that says the, that the expropriating authority may decide not to proceed with the expropriation uh, of the property. Um, the house is wondering why it would be it would be that the expropriating authority may decide not to proceed with expropriation of the property even if there may not be an immediate need to warrant expropriation expropriation should take place as a means uh, of transformation and therefore the expropriated property should be expropriated 
held by the government uh, or minister and list it, uh, you can, it can even be leased back uh, to the person that it has been expropriated uh, for, as we believe that expropriation should be understood broadly as a process of transformation to redress the legacy of the past. In terms of clause eight and 21, that deals with notice of expropriation and determination by court, the bill gives powers to the state to take property by serving a notice on the owner. And it also gives powers to the owner to contest for compensation up to a court of law. It further allows the courts to adjudicate only on the compensation offered by the state and not on the validity of expropriation. Property rights as contained in section 25 of the Bill of Rights in the Constitution of the Republic is clear. That is section 25 2B of the Constitution specifically determines that property may be expropriated subject to compensation, the amount of which and the time and manner of payment of which have either been agreed to by those affected or decided or approved by a court. The bill further says that <clears throat> the state may give expropriated owners 60 days in which to sue for more compensation, failing which they will be deemed to have accepted the offer. People who do not have the means to sue within the time period will not have their dispute over compensation decided by the courts. In terms of clause nine, uh, that deals with vesting and possession of expropriated uh, property. Uh, clause 93B, um, which I believe that um, members of this committee are aware uh, of what it says, we believe that is the National House uh, and propose that there should be a way of determining and recording the status of the property upfront so as to avoid willful or negligence on the part of the owner or holder of the expropriated a property to maintain the property or to intentionally appreciate the property to, ju to justify high compensation. In terms of clause 12, uh, that deals with compensation for expropriation. Uh, clause 12, 1C, uh, which deals with, the, with regard to the market value of the property. The cl this clause implies that in determining compensation, it should also be taken into account the market value of the property. The House submits that it should also take into account the property benefits the expropriated holder enjoyed over time, as well as his or her current standing. The, fee, the free usage of natural resources by the selected few is considerable. Clause 12, 2D, uh, which states that in determining the amount of compensation to be paid, the expropriating authority must not, unless there are special circumstances in which it would be just and equitable to do so, uh, take into account the interest of other persons which may be affected by the relief ordered. The House submits that this may be a deliberate and attempt for enrichment and therefore cautions against uh, this. In terms of Clause 21, uh, that deals with mediation and determination by the court. Uh, clause 21, 4, or subsection 4, provides for a court to make such order as it considers just and equitable if a provision of this act has not been complied with. The house is of the view that the courts of law are going to be burdened with expropriation and it would appear that the process may be dragged for long unnecessarily. The house submits that the office of the chief justice should be approached to dedicate courts uh, for this, pro for this uh, process. This also talks to clause 22.7a, which provides for the expropriating authority to approach the court for an extension of the period of temporary usage beyond 12 months. If the owner or holder of an unregistered right whose right and property has been taken does not agree, this also justifies the need for dedicated uh, courts. Um, I thank you. This is uh, our submission uh, as the National House of Traditional Leaders. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nkosi Mashangu. I now invite honorable members to ask clarity seeking questions on this presentation. Honorable Graham Mare. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Nkosi Mashangu, thank you very much for a very um, detailed and considered input. Um, and I think you've made some fantastic recommendations in your input. I just wanted to ask you for some clarity. You, you've requested or you've proposed 
that there's a, an exemption on communal land. Now, the purpose of the expropriation bill is not just around land reform. Um, so it's not just about um, expropriating property for land reform purposes. The expropriation bill also gives powers to the government to expropriate land for its own purposes. So that would be for building a road or for building a hospital or a school or something to that effect. So that would be where it's building, um, it's expropriating land for a public purpose. So my question to you then is if all communal land is exempted from expropriation, what would your proposal then be with respect to how the government would um, utilize property, given that government can't build on somebody else's property, they can't, they can't build infrastructure on somebody else's property. How would you propose government then approaches um, utilization of communal land where it is required for public purpose? Thanks very much. Thank you, Honorable Graham. Mare, over to you, Gosima Kangu. Uh, no, thank, thank you so much, uh, Chair. I, I think we are all aware that um, the land that is held by traditional leaders, it is uh, in the hands of uh, the Department of Rural Development. And we believe that, uh, that that land is already in the hands of the state. So it would require just a negotiation between the traditional council and government. And I think that's what we always uh, ask for, that we do not oppose a development that is supposed to be done in land that is in the hands of traditional leaders. But what we want is that we need to sit down and know what is going to be done there and agree with whoever uh, that wants to bring a uh, development uh, on that uh, piece of, of land. And in most cases, I think there's never, there, there hasn't been instances where we'd say no. We'd only say no when we are not consulted uh, as a sector. Thank you. Thank you, Gosi uh, Mashangu. Uh, as we have no further questions, uh, let's appreciate uh, the time and the input and the presentation that you have done uh, in the portfolio committee, which is very clear and with, uh, with clear recommendations. Uh, your input and presentation will be uh, consolidated with all other inputs and we will discuss as the committee when we are true with public hearings that are starting in April. Thank you again. Uh, we, we then invite the, um, the Minerals Council, which will be represented by Ms. Brown. Um, good afternoon, Madam. It's for morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Honourable Members. Um, my name is Ursula Brown. Um, I represent the Minerals Council of South Africa. Madam Chair, if I may just check, um, is my screen showing on your side? Yes, Ms. Brown, it is showing. Thank you. Um, Let me just start from the beginning. Apologies. Just a short introduction, um, Madam Chair, on who we are. The Minerals Council is a private industry advocacy body which represents more than 70 large, medium, small, and emerging mining companies, as well as three associations, which represents um, plus minus 200 entities. Collectively, our members make up about 90% of South Africa's mineral production by value. Um, we exist as an industry um, um, principal advocate of major policy positions endorsed by our industry employers, and we represent these policy positions organs of state, um, both on a national as well as provincial level, um, and both in South Africa as well as abroad. Um, as a precursor to the discussion, I just want to point out um, that the Minerals Council and its members do support the need for the implementation of a sustainable and, and effective land reform 
um, program, especially given our country's history and legacy of land um, dispossession. We also agree that there needs to be a concerted and a collaborative effort um, to address the issue of ownership um, 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 in the country. Um, having said that, Madam Chair, we also believe that the processes that, that are adopted to achieve these objectives need to be clear. And it is in this context that we want to take you through a um, couple of issues in, um, during today's presentation. We will specifically focus on those technical issues which we believe could make the ball vulnerable to protracted legal and constitutional challenges, which we believe should be avoided um, at all costs. The first issue that we've identified, Madam Chair, relates to the timing of the ball. I think we are all aware that the ball has been tabled in Parliament against the backdrop of the National, National Assembly's Assembly's um, appointment of a constitutional review committee to amend section 25 of the constitution to provide specifically for expropriation um, without compensation. Um, I think we're also aware, Madam Chair, that these processes are still ongoing and still needs to be completed. And once that is completed, it still needs to go through the national legislative amendment processes as provided for in section 73 to 82 of the Constitution. In light of these processes still being um, ongoing and continu continuing, um, we wish to point out that we believe that it's premature for this bill, i.e. the expropriation bill, to provide in its long title that the bill will specifically be enacted to provide for certain instances where expropriation with no compensation may be appropriate in the public interest. We also believe um, it is inappropriate at this point in time to quote in the preamble of the bill, um, section 25 of the constitution. Um, the um, um, quote deals with the current um, provisions of section 25. And we believe that these provisions might easily become outdated and historical once the um, 18th Amendment constitutional processes have been completed. Uh, we therefore believe that um, if Parliament proceeds with the bill um, in its current form, um, there might be questions around the rationality um, and reasonableness of these decisions. The second issue that we that we would like to point out relates to the determination of compensation as provided for in Section 12 of the bill. Section 12 specifically states that the, the determination of the compensation and specifically the amount of com compensation to be paid must be just and equitable. We don't have a problem with, with that provision. However, we point out that um, the provisions in this bill must align to what is currently provided for in, in the constitution. And in this regard, we, we note that section 25 subsection two and to be as well as section 25 subsection 3 of the constitution not only refer to the amount of compensation but also the time and manner of payment hereof and um, unless unless the provision is amended to include a reference to the time and manner of payment we do believe that there might be a risk of a constitutional um, challenge and as you can see, we have made the recommendation that section 12.1 be am amended um, to reflect that. In addition to that, we point out that um, section 25.2b of the constitution specifically states state that the compensation, um, that the time and manner and the payment of the compensation must be agreed to by those affected or decided or approved by the court. In this regard, Madam Chair, we wish to point out that there are numerous provisions in Chapter 5 and Chapter 6 of the bill, which seeks to confer uh, a power on the expropriating authority or someone else other than the court to determine the, the time and manner as well as um, the payment of, com of compensation. Again, um, we point out that these clauses contravene section 25, subsection 2B of the constitution, 
and is vulnerable to, 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 to a challenge. Thirdly, we wish to point out that Section 12C um, provides that it may be just and equitable for no compensation to be paid where the land is expropriated in the public interest having regard to all re relevant circumstances. I think um, the point that we want to make here is that um, currently um, Section 25 in its unamended form does not provide for no compensation. And um, what is presented here requires an interpretation that goes much wider than the founding pro provisions of what is currently provided for in Section 25, um, 2B and 3 of the Constitution. And um, in tabling the bill in this form, um, Parliament is being asked to invade what in the Constitution we believe um, is the preserve of the judiciary. And um, sections um, 12, 3 and 4, we believe, seeks to assert the powers which are expressly afforded um, to the judiciary. Um, and in doing so, we believe it offends against the doctrine of separation of powers, which is entrenched in section one um, of, of the constitution. Um, with regard to um, the specific clauses um, provided in section 12.3 and also section um, 12.4 of the board, um, I think we all are aware that these clauses provide for specific circumstances where expropriation um, for no um, compensation um, might be permissible. Firstly, um, Madam Chair, it's not clear um, why these specific circumstances have been identified. Um, also, um, this is not a closed list of, 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 of circumstances, um, and we don't know what these additional circumstances might be. But there's no guidance given to us as to how these factors um, should be considered or what weight weight um, should be accorded um, to, to, to these factors. Um, looking at the specific provisions, specifically clause um, 12, subsection 3a, um, we believe that um, this clause se seeks to discriminate against landowners whose sole purpose or businesses may be to speculate in land. In this regard, we point out, you know, that this uh, will contravene, contravene the equality clause as provided for in section nine of the constitution, as well as the right to freedom of trade, occupation and profession um, as stipulated in section 22 um, of the constitution. With regard to um, clause 12, subsection 3C, uh, we noted that abandoned land has also been identified as one of the factors that could lead to, um, to, to no compensation. Uh, we are not clear why it is necessary to include this uh, abandonment when it happens, and abandonment is a factual assessment um, that's informed by the intention of the owner, whether or not um, he or she wants to abandon the land. But once that happens, the land automatically accrues to the state. So it is not clear um, exactly why, why this provision has been uh, inserted, inserted. And then secondly, um, um, in the context of section 12, subsection 3C, um, abandonment is defined in a very narrow context. Um, it's defined as a failure to exercise control over land. Uh, we believe this is an incorrect um, definition as um, abandonment, as I pointed out, is a legal concept um, and an established legal concept by that. And it has also been clearly defined um, by our courts. With regard to clause 12, subsection 3E, um, again, we're not clear why the reference to um, property that poses a health and safety risk um, has been included. This is particularly relevant in the context of mining. Um, mining by its nature um, presents um, health and safety risk. Um, having said that, there are stringent um, provisions in the Mine Health and Safety Act, which uh, mining companies have to comply with 
to ensure that the impacts are or the negative impacts um, from a health and safety uh, perspective are adequately um, managed and mitigated. Um, in this regard, we would therefore suggest that the word unlawful um, should be inserted before health and safety to specifically um, deal with those instances where um, um, the property um, presents an, un an unlawful health or safety risk. Um, secondly, um, we in reading section 12.3, uh, we our view is that this specifically deals with, with, with the issue of land. Um, and in section 12e, references are made to um, property uh, as opposed to land. Um, we believe that the reference to prop property in this context is, is incorrect um, and it should be aligned to the other to the other provisions um, in section 12.3 that specifically focuses on the issue um, of, of land. Um, coming to clause 12.4, I think some of the other speakers have also addressed this issue. Um, we, our view is that this, this provision is clearly in contravention with section 23 of the Labour Tenants or the Land Reform Act, which specifically states that um, the owner of affected land or any other person whose rights are affected shall be entitled to just and equitable compensation as prescribed by the constitution for the acquisition by the applicant of the land or the right in land. There's, this, there's therefore a clear disconnect between what, between what is stated in the, in the Labour Tenants Act and what is envisaged um, in terms of section 12.4e. Um, Going back to clause two, um, this provision deals with state-owned corporations' ability to veto acts of expropriation. Um, this provision specifically states that an expropriating authority may not expropriate the property of a state-owned corporation or a state-owned entity without the concurrence of the executive authority responsible for that corporation or entity. It is our view that this clause affords um, the executive authorities responsible for state-owned entities or, co or corporations the ability to veto um, the expropriation of any land owned by such um, corporations. Um, and the bill does not afford a similar um, right to private owners uh, or occupiers of land. In this regard, we believe that the, this provision offends the doctrine, doctrine of equality as provided for in Section 91 of the Constitution, which specifically provides that everyone is equal before the law and has the right to equal protections un, under the law. And it also offends um, Section 331 of the Constitution, which specifically provides that administrative actions need to be um, needs to be reasonable. Um, with regard to section nine, um, this issue, this, this provision deals with um, the vesting of, of, of the expropriated property. Um, what we do have here is a concern with the definition of unregistered rights. And I think this previous, previous speaker has already mentioned that. Unregistered rights, it's defined as a right that has not been registered, um, nor is it required um, to be registered. Um, this presents a difficulty to, uh, to us, specifically from a mining perspective, because when mineral rights are granted, um, it might take a significantly long time for the right to be registered. Um, and in that regard, it does not fall within the definition of an unregistered right because it is not nor required to be registered. It also doesn't fall within the definition of a registered right, which is um, a, a, as, as provided. So technically those rights will fall within an, in an unregulated um, um, category. Um, our recommendation is that section 9.1 of the will be amended um, to specifically reference 
um, those rights which have those mineral rights which have been granted but not yet registered. With regard to section 91B um, Roman 2, uh, we also recommend um, that the section be amplified to in additionally include a reference to mineral stockpiles and residue dumps. These are mineral um, dumps which have been um, established before the NPRDA came into, into effect. Um, it will fall within the definition of an unregistered right. And what we're asking is that Parliament consider excluding this from um, these, these dumps from vesting with the property on, um, on its preparation um, of the property. Um, we have a concern um, with regard to section 17.3 and 21.8 of the bill. Um, what we do see is that these provisions have created a situation where an expropriated owner or an expropriated holder may lose the right to possession of land long before compensation um, might have been paid. And this will particularly become relevant in instances where the amount of compensation is subject to lengthy and protracted um, litigation processes. Uh, we also point out that this is in direct conflict with Section 25 b of the Constitution, which currently expressly provides um, that the property can only be expropriated um, subject to, to compensation. And in this regard, we Admit that the bill does not adequately safeguard the constitutional rights um, to compensation that an expropriated owner or holder um, enjoys. And lastly, Chair, uh, we just want to um, bring your attention to some um, definition ambiguities. Um, I think the previous owner has all, the previous speaker has also referenced the issue of land. Um, land has not been defined in the bill, although um, the term land parcel has been defined, but it is not used um, in the same context as land. And this is uh, it's, it's particularly relevant um, with regard to section 12.3 of the bill, which deals with the instances where it would be just and equitable for no compensation um, to be paid. Um, we're also not clear where the intention is that um, land include uh, rights in land. Um, and we would recommend that this, def that this definition, um, you know, be, be recon that consideration be given to inclusion of a definition of land, taking into account all of these um, factors that I've just mentioned. Um, the issue of public interest, um, although there is a definition um, in the bill, um, what we believe it does, it seems to conflate um, the provisions of sections 25.4a and section 8 of the Constitution, sorry, section 25.8 of the Constitution. Um, having said that, the definition does not include the provision in section 25.8 that equitable address must be achieved subject to a provision that any departure from the provisions of the section is in accordance with the provisions of section 36.1 um, of, of the constitution. And section 36.1 um, um, deals specifically with the limitation of rights. Um, and we are of the view that um, the omission um, to section 36.1 potentially has the effect of rendering the definition of public interest um, unlawful. Chair, I think I've already dealt with our concern in relation to, to unregistered rights. Um, there are some other issues that we have identified and um, those are set out in our written submissions um, and I will leave it here for now. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to address you on, on our concerns. Thank you, Ms. Brown, uh, for your presentation. Uh, now inviting um, honorable members for clarity seeking questions. Honorable members. Honorable members. Uh, Ms. Brown. 
Honorable Matebula, before I come in. Honorable Matebula. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much uh, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, well, there's only one question that I just want to uh, pose or rather uh, get clarity on from Ms. Brown. Uh, Ms. Brown uh, says that the the amendment bill uh, does not safeguard uh, uh, the rights uh, uh, of the people in particular, those uh, whose property um, might be taken away uh, if the conditions as specified by the by the bill once it has been signed into law uh, are not uh, uh, met. Uh, Chair, I must indicate to Ms. Brown that this is a constitutional amendment uh, bill, uh, which in actual fact is in line with other sections which are contained in, in the bill which protects the, the rights of the people. Uh, one of which is section 36 and uh, section nine and 10 of our constitution, which guarantees the, the rights of our people. Uh, I just want to check with her uh, if then in an event that um, there is a violation of the rights of uh, those people who might be affected by this bill, if, uh, if those people will not have any recourse whatsoever. Uh, to challenge those uh, uh, rights of which the government will be having over their properties. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Matebula. Uh, Ms. Brown, my, my question um, is the Mining Council not working with the Trade and Industry Chamber that sits on NetLeg, uh, where the issues that you have raised in the in your presentation now not raised in netlink thank you chair and honorable member thank you for your questions with regard to the first question obviously um, anyone whose rights are adversely affected by the law or the law once it is enacted will have recourse to the courts. Um, but I think the point that we're trying to make is that we, will, we need to address those issues you know, before it gets to the court, but before it gets to the court. Because what normally happens is that, you know, you take a, a piece of legislation on review, for example, um, and then it gets involved in protracted legal um, um, processes that can actually take, um, couple of years um, to, to resolve. And the outcome of that is that the implementation of, of the legislation could be significantly delayed. So what we are stating and recommending is, you know, that uh, we need to look at these issues so that once the law is um, implemented, um, there's clarity and there's also certainty. And um, yeah, we can progress the issues that the the law actually in intended um, to, to achieve. Um, with regard to your question, Madam Chair, um, um, yes, we do form part of the Busse constituency. Um, I think what has happened in this instance is that um, we did not participate in those processes um, for, for, for reasons um, that I'm not going to disclose here. Um, I think um, at the time that I I, I joined Busse, the, sorry, I joined the Minerals Council, these processes were long ongoing. Um, as Mr. Bossoff has indicated, they have been involved in this process since 2013. So I think it is probably just an omission. Um, but yeah, um, we have thought it appropriate therefore to also address um, um, the issues that our members have identified. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, thank you for your presentation. 
uh, as I've indicated uh, earlier on, uh, your presentation will form part of the document that will be compiled for a consideration by the members of the portfolio committee. Thank you again. We, we now invite our, our last um, organization for the day, which is um, ANC Women's League team, which is led or by advocate Sandra Makwasha, I hope that I'm pronouncing it correctly, Dr. Kainsley Litchfield Shabalala, and advocate Noma Zocho Memani. Uh, the floor is yours, ladies. Thank you, Chairperson. Good day to you and the members of the portfolio committee. I am Advocate Sandra Magwasha. I'll be leading this presentation. Um, I would like to start by firstly um, underlining the purpose of the ANC. Oh, thank you for this slide. Um, the purpose of the bill from the reflection of the ANC Women's League. The purpose should provide for the expropriation and reparation of property and land in South Africa for the best interest of its citizens and to provide and to provide sorry apologies and to provide for matters connected therewith. And I think most of the previous speakers have alluded to the history of land and property in South Africa and the manner in which the racist racist legislative means that were used by the colonial powers and the apartheid regime were used to deprive African people of their land and property, therefore interfering with the cultural and the spiritual connectedness that the African people have had with the land. It's also very important to understand that land for African people is more than a source of financial resource. And I think in the, the privileged speakers that have spoken from a point of privilege have failed to understand the spiritual and the cultural purposes of land and property for African people. And I think when they were making the presentation, they were speaking from a point of a one percenter of South African that holds um, the, the property and the right to land in South Africa. It's very interesting to understand that those who work the land do not own the land and those who need the land do not have the land. And those who want to retain the land have vast lands that are sitting vacant and are not doing anything with the land for the assistance of the South African people and the majority and specifically the most vulnerable members of our community who are in this instance, black women who are from poor and vulnerable communities as mentioned by our previous speakers in the Western Cape. I think that is a great case example of why, the, why we need this bill and the importance of the bill in trying to remedy the past racial legislative acts that dispossessed our people, as well as trying to map up a future way the South African people and its citizens contribute to the economic growth of the country. We're not, we are fully aware that women in, uh, in urban areas, in rural communities have small scale farming and who need the financial assistance to prevail in this um, situation. So the naysayers who are, who are making us look at the worst case scenario without adequately improving the bill or adequately addressing the issues that they have with the bill are not assisting in creating a rainbow nation that they are saying that we are working towards. How do you walk hand in hand with someone when you live in a lavish 1% lifestyle and the rest are in, 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 in um, poverty? Um, I would like to go to the second aspect of this. Um, sorry, apologies for that. I just lost myself there. Um, our submission as the ANC Women's League um, chairperson is that the amendment version, the amended version of the bill, we have our submission in respect of which aspects of the bill will be, will we find necessary to be amended. And we have this idea that not only do we want to expropriate for specific per, um, preferences, but we believe in the act of reparations and then Dr. Vilakazi will speak to that and highlight the importance of the history of reparation and how it can be done in South Africa. And the idea behind the bill is to ensure that we empower 
the poor and the most vulnerable members in our community after following due process for either compensation for yes for either following due process for either comp exploitation with or without compensation depending on the history of the land and property in question and that goes in line with section 25 of the current constitution as it stands and i know that we have had debates around what does section the, the section 25 mean does it mean without or with expropriation i will then go to my first speaker and allow her to speak in terms of chapters five to eight and address the committee on that aspect Thank you very much, uh, Sandra, for the introduction. And thank you, Chairperson of the committee, honorable members, you are treated, all protocol observed. Um, chapter five is the chapter that speaks on compensation or expropriation. And that compensation for the descendants of the settler population in South Africa is calculated at what is called market value. So they are saying South African government for what the land that will take from us, this is the economic value that we will suffer. Now the Women's League asks, has anybody ever stopped to think of the loss that has been suffered by the dispossessed? For over 400 years, since 1652, the indigenous populations of this country have not been in command of their land. What have they lost? I think this would span volumes of an encyclopedia. And since we do not have the time, I will save the committee's time and introduce this to three things. We lost spiritually. I think Pretty talked to it the second speak of today, and Sandra has just talked to it again. Um, land for Africans is not a commodity. It is not a property. Land for Africans is a physical plane that takes us to the metaphysical plane. Why am I saying that? Because our altars are erected on the land. Um, Samoa is erected on the land. Our departed, who is a bridge between us and the originator, what people call God, is on the land. So land for us is what the church is to Christians. It is what the mosque is to Muslims. It is what the temple is to Hindus. And you know, in the law and armed conflict, you are prohibited, no matter how much you hate your enemy, to attack places of worship, as I have uh, counted them. But we were attacked on our land and violated. Our altars were de desecrated. In fact, the tombs were looted. And the evidence stands in European museums now who are proudly displaying the loot of what they took from this continent, unashamedly. That's the spiritual loss that happened to Africans economically. They always tell us about the Wall Street crash. No honorable members. There's actually a crash of 1873 that lasted until 1896, the European economic crisis, which is why it was within that period that they called in 1884 to 1885 for the Berlin Conference, where they agreed for the partition of, it's actually called the scramble for Africa. And what were the chief tenants they need to avail the minutes of that meeting and ask who dig and dig. We find some of these things. Chiefly, land grabbing was what Europeans agreed upon. That to take them out of the economic backmire, they will dispossess Africans and turn them into servitude in the land of their uh, 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 mothers and fathers. They agreed on cheap labor of Africans. They agreed that Africa shall be the bedrock that returns Europe to economic prowess. And they did exactly that, which is why in 1806, the British formed what is called the British Chartered Company, BSA, Yaga Cecil John Rhodes. And you know, they still do that today, where the, the companies take care of the economics and the European governments take care of protecting them, protecting them and the politics. So that's why you had the Dutch East India Company, the British uh, uh, South Africa Company. I mean, companies as far as Denmark had chartered companies that were reaping uh, uh, economic benefits out of Africa. What did we lose? The third thing, self-governing activity. Um, honorable members, I don't want us to cower under the table each time we talk about expropriation of land without compensation and racist uh, uh, people throw at us like it was done this morning already. 
throw at us the issue of the Fatane. They say, oh, when we found you here, you were disorganized, killing each other. No, that actually such a bastardized version of history. It happens to everybody on the face of this planet. It's called state formation. We should own the Fatane and not be ashamed of it because it showed that we were people in motion. We were in a process of what is called state formation. It happened when the cells were differentiating into the Irish, the Scots, and the Welsh, when the Germanic people were differentiating into Anglo Saxons and the English. It happened when Bismarck unified Germany. So they mustn't come here and tell us they came here to civilize us. They did us a favor by taking our land because we were killing each other. No. The difference with the examples that I've just cited is that those people, they didn't have a Mazul Nabesu to come and add to the confusion of what was going on in their state formation. They were allowed to develop on their own. We have been denied it. So that is the loss, which is why the women's is saying there shall be no compensation for land expropriated from descendants of settlers. And yeah, they will stand here and tell you I was not there in 1652. Tough love. If you are not a perpetrator or a beneficiary, either way you have benefited from this land. So we stand to say there shall be no compensation for them. Instead, we argue something different. Seeing that they have such indignation after 400 years of oppressing us, to still call for being compensated for the land that they grabbed and ripped economic activity out of it for over 400 years. Because they have that indignation, we have our own indignation. We therefore call for reparations, that this land has made profit for them for over 400 years. It cannot come back to us naked because we lost economic activity for the number of those years. So we call for reparations. Let the land come without expropriation uh, to uh, descendants of white settlers, but also let the land come with reparations. What are reparations? A few facts. This must not also make us want to cower under the table. Reparations are an established process under the United Nations. Reparations are happening in history. They're happening now as you and me are sitting here and talking because in America, they are, have decided in a town, I just forget the name, it was in the news yesterday, they are deciding to, they are going to use housing as a means to pay reparations to African-Americans. It's not enough, they're contesting it, but what I'm saying is it's in motion. Uh, the Jews were paid reparations. Actually, they are still being paid reparations, by the way. Uh, and reparations are never popular. A, a, a census that was done in, in West Germany in 1951 shows that only 29% of Germans believe that they owe Jews reparations. Despite that fact, it was adopted in 1952. And over the period of the, the next 14 years, West Germany received 3 billion marks from the German government. And 450 million marks were paid to the Jewish Congress because they are the custodian of Jewish people wherever they are. So this is an established fact. We are not inventing a spaceship to go to Jupiter here, something that has never been done before. Reparations have been paid in history for a wronged population. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. And how do we work out reparations? It is simple. I love Africans, I love my people, because we live according to our clan and our ethnicity, which is why in Anamsanje, she has good, mauti eskodinsa kwa ngogo, ushogu upi olundi, mauti eskodinsa kwa mkwena, there is that in the Northwest. So we are saying it is easy to calculate reparations. They mustn't tell us, oh, but we were not there, or Hita is not there, but Germany is still paying Israel annually, by the way. Uh, in fact, now they're even paying for COVID reparations of the aged survivors of the uh, 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 Holocaust. So it's easy. They mustn't tell us they were not there. We don't know how we will do this. It will be confusion. Uh -uh. Pay them by ethnicity, pay them by clan. And if you do that and you couple that with reparations money, you are ensuring that that land that is being uh, 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 taken away and given to a landless majority, the owners of it, shall not lie waste. Because if you do that, you are already fostering the communal spirit which was here before. So you're actually calling the communities for cooperatives, for joint business ventures, and for community-based business ventures. And we are saying in that African women should be prioritized. Why are we saying so? Because if anybody is sitting here today and still honestly believing that customary law is African, then they don't know African history. 
really call them to go and read it up. Because customary law is an 1878 law that was written by the British in Natal. And they don't deny that when they wrote it, they had not nullified the Dutch Roman law because we were Dutch colony before we were English colony, by the way. And they also were using their own the English law. And three tenets, uh, they, say, they say the law when they wrote it in 1878 was a, a draft, but it changing. But they say three things stayed constant and they made sure. The first one is that the African woman is the property of the men. The second one is that the children are the property of the man who is the head of the woman. The third one is the law of progenitor, that the firstborn male shall be the one that inherits land. So we are saying African women should be prioritized because African women have never been the property of men. As a matter of fact, African women in this land to date are in charge of agriculture, and that's where we, that's what we were. And because we were in charge of agriculture, we were in charge of the whole food value chain, which is how we controlled markets, controlled seeds, controlled what is to be eaten in the home. That's how we ended up being the cooks. It was not oppression. It's because we understood what hair goes with what. So we are saying women in this uh, 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 land that is being taken back to its owners should be prioritized because to date we are the bulwark of agriculture in this continent. So that is our submission on chapter six. I hope it is clear. No expropriation for descendants of settlers and we demand for reparations. Oh, and by the way, the Dutch government and the English government should not be uh, let loose on this one. They owe us reparations uh, 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 for, for the land that was taken because they were in touch of the process as Germany is paying even if Hitler is paid. On chapter six, our submission is very simple. Uh, we are only arguing for the time periods uh, in this section. We are saying that matters brought before the court should be uh, speedily resolved so that it does not affect the party's content. And we call for a provision in the regulations to be attached to the bill to this effect. Thank you very much. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. And in chapter seven, our submission is that we merely uh, uh, suggest the reduction of the 30-day period to 15 days, again in the spirit of what uh, we suggested in chapter six, that the resolution of these matters would be a priority for government. Thank you. The next one, please. Chapter eight deals with withdrawal of expropriation. The Women's League find this chapter actually confusing. And it scares us because it can be a chapter that opens a can of worms because we already are aware of the indignation of the one percent that owns the land who have no remorse, who are not prepared to let it go, who actually have the nerve to say, pay me for the land that I stole. So we are saying this chapter can open a can of worms. We rather recommend that it doesn't end as a chapter, but it becomes a subsection of chapter seven and that uh, it says where there is no longer need for the state to expropriate land for public interest, which will be in rare cases because how would you have come through all the processes that are so legally tedious and then arrive at a place where you say, I don't need expropriation anymore. But because legally you don't, that you don't close the loop, we say, okay, we keep the loop open, keep it as a subsection in chapter seven and word it and say in the stringent cases where it appears that there is no longer need for the state to expropriate for public interest, then the expropriation can be withdrawn. Thank you so much. I will now ask uh, our next speaker, uh, the advocate. The next speaker, please. Sorry, Chairperson, I was busy talking and that I am uh, on mute. Sorry, very sorry. So I was saying, Chairperson, that I will start with uh, chapter one, but what I want to state is that the ANC Women's League uh, consulted 
and then consulted all women in, 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 in all women in South Africa. We consulted with white women, Indian colors, and, and African women on this bill. So our voice, and it's a voice of women, it must be acknowledged. And then on chapter one, women are saying, they're proposing that we must add the following definitions to this bill, the landlessness, because it is an embarrassment in South Africa to find South Africans who are landless in their country. The homelessness, it is also embarrassing in South Africa to find the citizens that are homeless. And then the reparations, as the previous speaker has, has indicated, and then that we want the reparations to be added in the definitions. And then the mediation committee is also what women are asking that they must be inserted in the definitions of the spell. And then now I will go to chapter two, that is on the slide, that the ANC Women's League endorses the power of the minister and acknowledges that the bill is a cross-cutting and the bill must also outline the powers of the other minister, that the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, as well as the Minister of Human Settlements, as they are the secondary stakeholders. But however, I must also indicate that the Women's League was of the opinion that this bill should be located in the Department of Land, uh, land uh, Department of Agriculture, Land and Reform. However, now it is with the, uh, what is it, public, public works, then that is fine, but the legislatures will deal with that. And then the next slide, I will deal with section five, subsection 1A, and then that deals with the investigation and evaluation of property. The ANC Women's League endorses the proposal and acknowledges the importance to conduct thorough evaluation and investigation and proposes the adoption of an efficient coordinated system that will ensure that the suitable land is expropriated. A lack of such happened during the willing seller, willing buyer tenure, which resulted in government purchasing unsuitable land, which is currently contributing to the land demand pressure. The need for land in South Africa is both complex and immediate for, res for residential purposes, as well as agricultural farming should be accounted for. The next slide. That is uh, 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 sub section five, subsection one B, the registered and unregistered. ANC Women's League also proposes the publication of the outcome of the investigation for transparency to enable us to, to be aware and claim their, so uh, enable women to be aware and claim their rights either as registered or unregistered owners. We acknowledge that women are not empowered to participate in issues affecting them. A lack of transparency in this regard can be overlooked and the existence of registered or unregistered rights owned by women. The next one, please. Sorry. Sorry, the next slide, it's section five point, uh, section, section five, subsection 2A, sorry. This clause should be aligned with the method to be adopted in the case of compensation and then with option of cash or installment. Of course, I will talk of compensation in relation to what the previous speaker has said that the compensation should be recognized on certain circumstances. And then the value, so in terms of section five, uh, subsection 4A, we acknowledge as the Women's League that anyone can have access to doc documents to prove ownership, to propose commitment to a thorough investigation, to involve persons or stakeholders to validate those documents. Failure to validate the documents may result in women being denied their property rights, especially during the death of their spouse, and particularly those women who are married and customary law. And then in chapter four, with the intention to expropriate and expropriation of property. And then we are saying chapter section seven, notice of the intention, the notice must not only be served, but it must be explained in the language of the owner and or occupy or unregistered rights holder. Merely serving the notice would disadvantage its owners, particularly those who cannot read and write, occupiers and unregistered uh, uh, right holders or fully understanding their obligations and rights in respect of the notice, especially section 11, subsection five, which essentially holds an owner financial liable for non-disclosure of persons with unregistered rights over the land. The next please. And then section seven, subsection two C, 
we are saying that there must be no cause for obtaining the purpose of the expropriation. And then subsection 72, G4, we say we need also to include the sign language in this, in this bill. So as to cater for people living with disabilities. And then chapter four, okay, continuation. Then section eight, notice of expropriation, the date of vested ownership is the date of the expropriation, perhaps ownership occurs on the date of transfer. This section creates an uncertainty around ownership, possession and transfer. And this dispute must be referred to the courts and actually, we have proposed that there must also be a mediation committee, and then it fails there, then it can be referred to the courts for determination. However, it will ultimately result in expropriation matters being stuck in court. This leads to a difficult situation where the expropriation authority is the owner of the land without having compensated the owner, occupier, and unregistered right owner. Can you, next one, please? The next slide, please. And then the minister, Sorry, the minister regulation may, regulations may perhaps provide clear time periods for expropriation of land and property cases to be dealt with, or minister may empower the land court to specifically have exclusive jurisdiction to adjudicate matters under expropriation bill. The next one, please. And then the next one, in terms of section nine, we are saying as the women, there must be a record, an updated record at the deeds registry of expropriation and transfer and the withdrawal of the expropriation land. And then we are appealing, in closing, we're appealing that parliament listens to women of South Africa. Thank you. Is it? Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Martinez. Can you assist me? Um, I can't open my video because it has been disabled. Okay, let me speak even if my video is off. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, ANC Women's League for your presentation. I am now inviting honorable members to ask clarity seeking questions on this presentation. Uh, honorable Siwisa. Honorable Siwisa. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've been listening to the presentation and I don't know, maybe it's me who don't understand. The one I, I, is the ANC Women's League saying that there should be compensation because at some point the, in the presentation it stated that there shouldn't be any compensation. And later on, there's a point that says there should be compensation. What happens in a case whereby it has been found that there has been illegal a, a acquiring of land. Uh, is the ANC Women's League saying that those people must be compensated if an investigation comes down to that the land was acquired illegally? So, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Siwisa, for your question. Uh, ANC Women's League team. Thank you um, for the question and Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. Um, we are very clear. We said no compensation um, for land that was dispossessed by um, a settler population and the descendants thereof because they've benefited from the land for over 400 years. Um, where compensation was referred to, it was compensation where the state has to uh, expropriate land from African hands for the greater use of the community. But we are very clear. We said expropriation without compensation, and we even stated why, which is why we gave elaborate historical analysis of how this land was taken and what was benefited out of it, and what African or and the indigenous people of this land lost. Thank you, Dr. Shabalala. Any other questions? 
honorable members on this presentation. Uh, no questions. Uh, thank you, uh, AN Smith League team. Uh, we appreciate that women are speaking up on land issues, knowing where we're coming from as women in South Africa, as women in the world, as women in general, how we were treated before. We appreciate that women can stand up and come up with your presentation. We will take your presentation as other presentation uh, consolidate into a report that we will uh, discuss at a later stage with the committee members. But I would like to um, make it clear to all those that have been here and all those that are watching, as from the 8th of April, we will be starting with the public hearings. We will be starting in Lipombo, but we'll observe the, the health protocols. Only 100 members will be inside that hall that we will be having our public hearings. So all those that have not made it into the oral presentations because they may not have requested, you are free to come to our public hearings. They will be advertised in all the media houses and all the national papers where will be and also on the parliamentary platform. Uh, thank you uh, to all our guests today who presented a uh, in fact, you have assisted us uh, in making us aware that there are many, um, if I can say it, there are many views out there on this uh, expropriation bill, uh, 23, 2020. There are many issues that uh, many people from diverse, um, from, from diverse uh, communities that want us to look at. As this committee, we promise that we will look at all that you have presented today. And we appreciate that some of you have gone to the chapters of the bill, have gone to the clauses of the bill and say that you must correct it like this and like this. We will then look at that combined, of course, with the written submissions that we have received and also with the information that we collect as we will be doing e public hearings. And then we will come up with something that we believe will assist many of South Africans. I think it has been indicated even today that many South Africans do want this expropriation bill because all of us believe that we can't continue with an act that predates even our constitution. We can't continue with an act that was made for the few that were ruling at the time. And we know that the courts of humanity have said that the apartheid was inhuman, the apartheid was wrong. So we can not continue with the laws, but we'll continue with what is in the constitution. So we're inviting you then to join us when we go for public hearings and present again your views on this bill. The public hearings will be done physically. We won't have virtual public hearings because we want to reach those rural of the rural people that don't have access to these gadgets that we are using when we are doing virtual meetings. Thank you again to our guests for your input and presentation. And thank you uh, to our honorable members for their progressive questions uh, that they asked our guests today and our support team. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>